Welcome, welcome, Vibe Tribe. What is up? We've got an incredible show for you guys tonight. Thank you for the patience as I took last Sunday off. There was no interverse. I didn't really even tell you know everybody why, but I got a new computer. Much needed. I've been on the same rig since 2017, so it took me a little bit of extra time to get all the setup there. And yeah, I'm loving it. It's way fast. <laughs> totally going to be cranking out some good stuff with this. Tonight, though, I don't even know how to describe this other than the death blow to the cult. <laughs> you know, that's what this conversation ought to be. We have Dylan Sicoccio, <clears throat> the triumphant author of the Spirit World series. We got Slick Dissident, my main man, and everybody in the chat. Thank you for sounding off. I see Jenny G, wifey, uh, Mar uh, MS, Braden. Who else we got here? Definitely uh, hit up your friends. Let them know that this is the show where they're going to be able to connect some very important dots of, in terms of the mystery traditions and religions of the world. This is a very exciting conversation. We're going to be referencing mostly all from one chapter, chapter eight of Dylan's newest book, Terminalia. It's called, the chapter is called uh, Dupers, Dup, Dupes of Their Own Deception, right? <laughs> <laughs> and if that isn't the correct description for, you know, what religions have become, I don't know what else is. So as we get into this, let's just be clear. It's not about dismissing the value of philosophy. It's not about dismissing the spiritual ramifications or the spiritual component of health and of healing. All of that is very accurate and real. I mean, there's there's real philosophy here but what we're disputing is like the forgery of mosaic history and the concealment of the ecclesiastical control system how what was a good true and beautiful philosophy became co-opted by the laziest dirtiest people <laughs> of society you know to basically leverage their intellect and their education against the people who actually do the physical work and labor of the world in order so that they could continue, you know, ruling. This is about the head, you know, the heads of society, arche meaning head and wisdom. Both things are going hand in hand here. So all of that aside, another really epic announcement is that we've got a new audio book ready for you guys. The Holy Sailors, the previous book, book five of Spirit World, is now on Amazon and Audible. So check the link in the show notes and you guys can get the narration by me. And it really will help even if you've read the book or you got the ebook or whatever. <laughs> I won't say that my pronunciation of all the Celtic words is accurate, uh, but it is helpful to hear how it, it is read. And I really enjoyed narrating that book. There's so much there that it's just mountains and mountains of gravy overload so check that out support dylan support me by getting yourself a copy of the holy sailors audiobook if you haven't done an audible free trial membership yet you can actually use the link in the show notes to get yourself that book as your free sample and we still get huh we still get something for that so you know take advantage of the program it's pretty helpful and I'm just super grateful for the opportunity to collaborate with Dylan on that. And this particular conversation, I've been so excited for all day. Since I read this chapter of Dylan's book, I was like, this is it. This is the death blow. <laughs> you know, this is the one. The, and it's really it. Reverend Robert Taylor is the main uh, source we're going to be referencing, although he's referencing older writers, the church fathers. But the way he lays it all out and the research that he did, that got him put in jail in his time in the early 1800s. You know, I'm very excited to be doing honor to a great thinker that came before us. And more than just him, there's about many good thinkers in this presentation we're going to talk about, but I've got about 30 slides just covering the first few pages of that chapter that's so good. But I think it's going to paint the picture for everybody, the 10,000 foot view summary of what maybe has really gone on in history to lead us to the type of world that we currently have and what was lost and covered up along the way, what was simply unnoticed. And then as time passed, it got kind of swept into the dustbin of history. There's so much to talk about, but let me introduce my boys. What's up, Dylan? What's up, Gabe? How you guys been? Great, man. Yo, yo, triumph. <laughs> yeah, man. Vini, Vini, Vici over here too. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, no, a lot of what we're going to talk about, the reason it's significant is because we've talked on previous shows that we've both, uh, both the two, uh, the three, we're like the three musketeers <laughs> of the, at this point. Uh, we've talked about this subject and how even the father of ecclesiastical history, Efsebius, uh, he literally wrote that the ancient Therapeuti were Christians and their writings are our gospels and epistles. So for anybody who takes exception with anything that we're putting down here, if you are a Christian and most Abrahamics to a, a lesser degree, but specifically for this, your own fathers, like everything you have regarding the, Christ, uh, the, the historicity of Christianity has come from Eusebius. So uh, it's, it's really a death blow. And what made Robert Taylor significant is he translated him when not a lot of people were translating back then some of these things. And that's really where um, a lot of the stuff that people would have the most value in, it's hidden in languages that most people have never even bothered to look into. And the ones that do, it's very obscure and you can't really find it on the internet because if you don't know what language to look it up in and how to write it in that old language, it's not going to return you any results. So you either have to have the copy of it and know how to type it in Greek to get the returns, or you need to have access to somebody who's translated in your language. So um, Robert Taylor wrote uh, a lot of these quotes are from his diegesis. And he wrote that in prison, Oakham prison, while he was being falsely imprisoned for blasphemy because he created a pamphlet prior to this, he created like a pamphlet, like a, like a 140 page pamphlet or something <laughs> like maybe he shouldn't have done that. Maybe she should have had like some more tact, but that's what they, that's what they threw him in there for. You say it's Oakham prison. Oakham yeah. prison. O O A K H A M. The, the dark Oak. <laughs> Sounds a lot like Arkham. Wow. Yes. I, I just learned Occam. I was just I was just learning today about uh Occam, the person that we get the term Occam's razor from. And that he was kind of like uh uh dividing the two wings of man that they we use to lift ourselves up, uh uh faith and reason. Mm -hmm. Those are the two wings we use to lift ourselves, and that Occam came along and uh made a divide in the uh in in the evolution of thought that's pretty profound that he's in that particular prison yeah and that's where it, and that's where the pressure to do this work came from that's really that's really something almost poetic in a way it almost gave him the time to do this work because he had nothing else to do so he you know he obviously still had access to you know books and you, people need to remember too that england it, the reason a lot of this great work came out in the like 19th beginning of the 19th century is because it coincides with being able to print stuff and not have permission, like, like coincides with the ability to be like criticism. <laughs> Whereas before this, like everything had to go through like this approval before it was like, a, you know, it'd be agreed to be published and it's, it's wild. So we have like a brief window where all these amazing researchers just, they, they had to take all the expenses on their own and pay for everything on their own, but they did it because a lot of them came from, you know, upper crust society. So we're very so let's fortunate. Keep, let's get thank into you. it. And I also want to say thank you for the very kind super chat, Rachel. Appreciate that a lot. <laughs> very cool. Hey, Rachel. Yeah. Always a great supporter. Very, very appreciated. Feel free. Anybody else to super chat too. <laughs> So we have so much ground to cover. I'm going to jump us right in. Um, I would appreciate maybe some some shares from the audience to their Telegram groups or to their friends, because to be honest, the amount of people currently viewing live for the quality of information that we're about to cover, it is uh, a bit absurd. <laughs> it's a bit absurd. So, you know, do us do us a favor however you can. And yeah, maybe it's on me for skipping Sunday's show and the algorithm got mad, but whatever. We're going to dive right in. Lots of ground to cover. So the first thing here is where Dylan actually opened his chapter with a quote from Virgil's fourth eclogue. Now has come the final era in the Sybil's song. 
the great order of the ages is born afresh. Now justice returns, honored rules return. Now a new lineage is sent down from high heaven. And this is a uh, passage that is taken by the later Christians of the Middle Ages to be a prophecy of Jesus. But of course, the Romans of his time applied it to different people. It's very much like the prophecy in the book of Isaiah that is <laughs> clearly about Cyrus, but is often put as a quote or quoted as a prophecy about Jesus. The point being that really the entire idea of a savior uh, being born and all the different trappings of that astrotheological narrative are in reference to the idea of and the belief in ages and great cycles of time. And so Jesus is an incarnation of Vishnu. Jesus is an incarnation of the preserver. Not the only time it's happened, not the last time it'll happen either, according to, you know, the philosophy, but where it all goes off the rails. And it's a beautiful system for comprehending how the world goes through larger cycles of destruction and regeneration. Society does, empires rise, they fall, hard times create strong men, strong men create good times, good times create weak men, weak men create hard times, you know, that whole thing. It's a very true, uh, th very true allegory, but to just take in and make it all about just this one guy is the only time there is any savior. He was a literal historical person. We're going to base our entire corporate <laughs> government <laughs> system off of it, uh, off of the office of this uh, allegory character it's a bit ridiculous but i'm sure dylan and gabriel probably both have more they'd like to say about this virgil well just make sure you recognize that he says things like virgo so things that are being translated or he says saturnia so if you look at the latin there's definitely astro theology but the reason this is significant in my opinion is saturnia is uh, a place in italy and i sent you uh that screenshot uh like it was an unsolicited image that just underlined some things but this is how you know saturn used to be an old archetype for the sun because it was also the same saturnia was also called orinia and you have the aur which is aura or you know it's all going to be uh, laid up with that sun symbolism but something that I, i'm actually working on this post right now i haven't published this yet but basically, Virgo's name, uh, Virgil's name, I should say, Virgo, uh, it is actually Etruscan. It's Publius Virgilius Mauro. And Mauro, in this context, is M-A-R-O, which is Etruscan. And it's connected with the title Maru, M-A-R-U, according to M.L. Gordon. And we've covered on this and in uh, our new audiobook that comes out, people will learn that Maur is Phoenician and it means great Lord or Prince. And what I'm going to be showing is that this is yet another proof of that the Etruscans were descended from the Phoenicians, if not the very navigators referred to as Puni, the root word of Phoenician. And it's also an indicator, in my opinion, that when you say, see things like Mount Meru, all these things that we have traditionally been taught come from India is actually coming from the Mediterranean on account of Etruscan not being Indo-European, whereas Greek, Indo-European. That's the mic drop. There is no descent from Greece. It's not in the language. It's not in the culture. And if you look at, and you know, I happen to be fortunate enough to be from an Etruscan family, and I know what they look like. And so one of the the things that was hard for people to uh, reconcile is why they look Celtic or Germanic. And they've suggested, well, did they come from north to south across the Alps into Italy? Or did they come from south to north? And if you look at other things I'm going to be publishing, the rites, the funerary rites, a lot of the customs, it's observable that it comes from Italy. And they are indigenous to Italy and Rome was quasi Etruscan. We've talked about the timelines of Rome not lining up, and that's because they're covering up the sanctioned universal maritime empire. 
which is Phoenician or Etruscan, Kelty, whatever you want to call it. But that's what's going on here. And that's why in a roundabout way, exposing this is so significant because it is coming from Egypt. And Egypt, the pharaohs, they hired the Phoenicians to go all over the world for them. Herodotus reckon, you know, admits this, sailing around Africa. All, there, there's just account after account after account of this being the case. And so as we try to figure out cultural diffusion, this maritime empire is going to be one of the big uh, common denominators of it. I'm learning a little Greek and I'm noticing a lot more of Greek taking on romance language words than the romance language is taking on the Greek words. I don't know. It's maybe just my perspective on it, but yeah. Uh, and I, I even noticed a little of uh, opposite world going on where like, you know, Orphite in Orania has a darkness to it in Greek, but in Roman, it means gold or illumination. So there's almost like culture war in the definitions where it's like, you know, a little bit of opposition uh, in the in the language in a fun way. I think so, we may even be looking at, like I said, branches of the same tree. Like it's not as different as we've been taught it is. You know what I mean? Like it's been this, mm -hmm. it's like a, it's in a way when things go sideways, of course, everybody's going to fight over their territory and stuff. But mm -hmm. ultimately in the grand scheme, before it breaks up and goes to war with itself, there is like this coalescence of, you know, in a time where people actually needed each other because you need to work with people to set all these things up. There's going to be bountiful trade because you're going to have things coming from certain places in like Eastern Europe where they've got amber, you know, and you, how many right. times you've heard this like ambrosia and all this amber symbolism being the nectar of the gods and all that other shit. But then, places in Italy have the metals. So there's going to be this constant uh, need for each other, you know, that breaks down when, when you have too much convenience in life, you forget how much you need people. But when you right. live in a more rural area, when there's less technology, you appreciate people, you're less likely to be hostile to each other. And when you look at the uh, Roman empire, even at its height, I think there's only like 50 million people in it. And you look at how vast it is. It wasn't as populated, you know, Europe, North Africa, Asia Minor, these places weren't as crowded as they are today. Yeah. And a, a lot of this uh, uh, managing of priorities uh, is kind of what makes the trade machine uh, stay in motion. You know, the fact that they needed the gold in the east and they needed silver in the west. So there's constantly flow going in the two directions. Uh, it just keeps the machine going. And it has for a very long time. That's why we sell our, our the the gas we pump out of the earth here overseas so far away is because it drives industry every step of the way, every mile it ticks. All right. I got to get us moving <laughs> or we'll be here for 10 hours. <laughs> I just did the math. If we do one slide in 20 minutes, we'll be, it's going to be a long show. <laughs> but uh, Brianna just got here. She says with such a title, curious about what this is about. Well, we're talking about the therapeutic. And they have many names. We're going to cover all that off. But let's talk about who are the Therapeutae. The primary source concerning the Therapeutae is the De Vita Contemplativa, the contemplative life ascribed to the Jewish philosopher, in air quotes, Philo of Alexandria of 20 BCE to 50 CE. The author describes the Therapeutae as philosophers who were the best of a kind given to, quote, perfect, perfect goodness that exists in many places in the inhabited world. The author derives the name Therapeutae from the Greek therapeo, therapeo, in the sense of cure or worship. Keywords right there, cure and worship. And even also rel relevant is how curate is one of the titles of uh, uh, these uh, guys and you know, curios means Lord in modern Greek, Kyria, Kyrie means Mr. and Mrs. So that word has always been a title of respect. And uh, I found an interesting little tidbit that I didn't have time to dive into more deeply, but I'm curious about his work analysis by the religious scholar Ulrich 
R. Kleinhempel <laughs> indicates that the most likely religion the therapeutic practiced was Buddhism. Uh, I think he's probably got a lot of good reasons to think that. So that's not exactly so much who they are. There's more to it than this, but you know, this is the origin of the term, maybe one of the oldest written records of the term. And guys, just jump in if you know uh, if you want to make comments on this. Otherwise, I'll kind of just move us forward. Well, yeah, if you look at the symbolism on his helmet, you'll see that cross with those dots. And if you turn that upright, you'll see that's a very common symbol in the Celtic, uh, Germanic world, if you will. Yeah, and it's also like the Mithraic mark on the head. Yeah, it's X marks. Which in the, the Bible is Tau. It's literally written as T A uh, T H A U. That mark. So it is a yeah. Tau. Good call. This is an illustration, uh, you know, an imaginative illustration, I'm sure, of Philo, mm -hmm. of Alexandria. Alexandria is a big part of this story as well. So Godfrey Higgins, referring to these therapeutae, he says, the gymnosophists, the Cassidians, the Essenes, the Therapeutae, the Dionysians, Dionysians, the Eleusinians, the uh, Pythagoreans, the Chaldeans, or in reality, all an order of religionists, including among them and consisting in great part of an order of monks who were, in fact, the heads of society. So <laughs> we can talk about, about this slide, maybe pause on this one. But here I have a, a list of some of the names that this sect has gone by in different areas at different times, or sometimes these names are simultaneously applied to them. But we have the Therapeutes, the Essenes, the Ascetics, the Monks, the Ecclesiastics, Eclectics, Gymnosophists, Cassidians, Dionysians, Eleusinians, Pythagoreans, and Chaldeans. Some of a lot of those Higgins just noted, but you know, if you <laughs> these like if you're kind of not very well versed in this research, you know, some of these names you'll see uh, might have your own association with it. You know, especially with maybe like Pythagoreans or uh, modern Christians with the idea of the Essenes. But who were they? You know, these are just words, unless you can kind of paint the picture of the origin of these groups. Uh, guys, you want to weigh in on, you know, these diverse titles? I thought it was interesting that I came up with 12 here. <laughs> Good call. Yeah, that is very interesting. Uh, uh, it's funny that this is coming up uh, very recently. Uh, I've been trying to kind of put my finger on the, you know, particularly the Dionysian, Eleusinians, uh, Pythagoreans. Um, in the Orphics, you know, uh, the Orphite mysteries, because they have a, a, a distinction in their flavor. And I can see echoes of them later on in religiosity, you know, and it's just fascinating to see the branches of the same tree, uh, you know, with uh, just different shades to the, uh, to the tone of the leaves, so to say. Like the Pythagoreans are going to have a, a heavy dependency on a, uh, uh, geometry is going to be even more sacred for them because that was required to get into the inner circle of the temple. You know, if you don't have command over geometry, don't even bother coming inside. Uh, well, that kind of rhymes with uh, Islam, where they can't, they don't have a god, they don't have a face, they don't have a, an idol, uh, no graven image, but they got geometry on lock. And if you go in their sacred churches, you're going to see geometric patterns in almost to the extent of, uh, uh, it's almost psychedelic how perfect geometry is to them. It's pretty far out. Yeah, and there's definitely like spiritual value to that of all of the groups, you know, of who I would want to hang out with. Maybe the Pythagoreans would be the coolest. <laughs> uh, as long, you know, the, it's where you get into the extreme aestheticism where it starts getting really ugly. And I mean, like, disgustingly ugly. You'd think with all that time they save by, you know, disregarding food and clothing that they might have time to at least wash themselves. But <laughs> at least in the modern sense, the aesthetics often don't. 
anyway, uh, the 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 gymnosophists, if that's a new one for people, that is a sect in India. Uh, the Greeks gave this name to them. Obviously. Just so you know, that G can function like a, a a Y or an H, so it could be him. We all know what hymns are, right? Oh, Hymnosophy. that's a super good point. I'm hearing it all the time in uh, in learning Greek, like. To say a little beer, you say ligi bira, but it's a G, but it sounds like you're saying ligi. You're basically doing an H sound. I mean, learning to actually speak modern Greek has been proving to me beyond all doubt that the letter swap stuff that we've talked about is extremely real. And actually, we've kind of like, we were actually a little tame on the possibilities. <laughs> it gets it branches so much. You don't realize how valuable what we've done here is until you do the work yourself. And that, that I know that's like some of it is kind of boring at first, but once you get it, it's like riding a bike, it becomes easy. And what you're seeing now is this overarching uh, thing that our founding fathers, especially Thomas Jefferson wrote, wrote about, which he, he wrote in a letter, I believe, or he said, history, I believe, furnishes us with no example of a priest ridden people that maintained a free civil government. And it is directly correlated with these cults, with these monks, the lack of freedom and the sinking into despotism that countries and nations go into communities, whatever, because these people are freaks. They're the non-productive class of society. And, and not even the ones that originated the philosophy that they took over. I think that's a really important point is like, it'll sound like we're just bashing spirituality or bashing esoteric thought, but really it's like, there was a beautiful system. It connected the world and made civilization flourish and grow. And then like some kind of a weird a hostile takeover, <laughs> you know, this, this system was eventually, you know, rotting from within and the, the and power I attracted the bad type of people to it. I think it's, you know, it's like the classic struggle of the individual versus the collective that as the collective gets more interconnected and stronger, the individual gets more and more, uh, you know, destroyed by it. <laughs> or challenged by it just want to also throw out there the the Cassadians. that's like an alternate way of referring to the chaldeans as far as i know so, yeah. so if that is an unknown and name for the audience for anybody who comes across this at a later time like your audience kind of gets a feel for you guys right but i wouldn't have been able to do this um uh <laughs> let's creep there I wouldn't have been able to do this work if I didn't have a commitment to service of truth and service to God. So just to back up what you're saying, it's not about, it has, this has nothing to do with spirituality. This has everything to do with service to truth and figuring out what's going on in this world. Oh, Gabe's, oh, I'm so glad Gabe's in crimson because I almost wore crimson, but it would have been real awkward if we both had crimson tank on time. So, you know, party on. Sun's out, guns out. Hey, didn't Gabe, you have something you wanted to get get out of the way in the beginning? You had a, some uh, precious info you wanted to delve into. Oh well, yeah, well, uh, the, on the gymnosophists, uh, I've had a really fascinating uh, series of discoveries around them. You know, they're notoriously. Uh, I think they're mendicant. They're generally nude, and there's a there's a, a thread around. Diogenes, the philosoph who was, uh, you know, hanging around butt naked in the street. They said he lived in a wine barrel and the dogs love to hang out with him. He's got, always got a lantern. Uh, he was uh, trying to steal students from Plato. Uh, he like bar barges into one of his classes with a uh, feathered chicken and starts walking it around, puppeteering it around upright. And he ends up stealing one student that day. He saves one student from Plato's school that day. There's a fa I've heard rumors that people say that this is an indication of like the sadhu uh, Hindu Baba uh, monks, you know, the aesthetic monks, uh, because he's naked, because he's lazy and hanging around in the street. Uh, but I've actually found him to, act, to also be Virgo. 
uh, and he corresponds with Virgo. And there's a thing about slothfulness and laziness uh, around Virgo. And I pulled out my uh, my hermit card. You know, and there's all these things that are baked into Diogenes, into the gymnosophists, you know, these butt naked, crude street dwellers uh, with dogs by their side. And, you know, it seems like it's so long ago. It seems so far back in history. Guess what? This is fucking Schopenhauer, too. All the things about Schopenhauer, the pessimist. Well, Diogenes was the cynic. So the pessimists and the cynics, they have a strange personality echo. It also, also strangely ties into Virgo in a fascinating way. And maybe so, the Stoics too, but like not a hundred percent, but you know, they're definitely cleaner. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, good point. And that Virgo, you know, used to be uh, Libra was the clause of the Scorpio, Scorpion, Kele. So it used to be like uh, associated with Scorpio more, but now it's the scales and that's traditionally held by that virgin blind right because right? justice is blind right and yes uh libra saturn exalts in that so there's kind of that motive there yes but i was does. gonna say it does read like when you were saying the story i was like this literally sounds like astrotheology to me it is totally astro and the thing that gets me so schopenhauer he stole students from hegel so hegel becomes like plato and schopenhauer becomes Di Di diogenes and their their biography is literally echoing the uh the myths of these philosophers in a really fascinating way so i just thought i'd throw that all out there and then one more thing that i uh don't want to miss out on is buotes is in virgo and this is the poets this is the the void the vacuum the uh the absence of light that brings in inspiration cat's have, asshole it's the asshole of the zodiac that's how you get that's how that's how you bring in inspiration you got to get out of your own way uh, so, yeah, all the things about the poets and the muses, somehow they're born like a, a immaculate conception out of the Virgo constellation. That to me reeks of reckoning the year, because when the sun goes into winter, that's when Virgo at midnight becomes the Lord of the Ascendant up through dawn where she's at the midheaven. So doesn't mean I'm right. Just that's usually the theme that I know I've come across. Yeah, buddy. All right, we're going to press on a bit, find out a little more about the Essenes. So we got a lot of quotes from Robert Taylor in this talk, and here he is describing the Essenes. The word Essene is nothing more than the Egyptian word for that of which therapeute is the Greek, each of them signifying healer or doctor and designating the character of the sect as professing to be endured endued with the miraculous gift of healing and more especially so with respect to diseases of the mind. I remember years back, I interviewed a guy who claimed to have like a direct knowledge transmission from the Essenes to the modern time. And I'd had no idea what Essenes even were. <laughs> You know, like I was a new podcaster, hadn't done this work yet. And, you know, looking at the guy in my mind's eye, my memory, and some of the things he professed, it was very much like the asceticism that we're talking about, you know, um, just also very similar to original Buddhism, the non-aggression against animals and the like veganism, you know. I think after the end of this, actually, we ought to be able to see that there's a clear link between the medical establishment, like the med the mafia of the medical establishment, the actual mafia, to and communism, veganism. Like when you when you really get the big picture of what we're going over here, you'll see that the origins of all the things that have been pushed on the world in the modern time and have been creeping slowly, more and more globally have they go all the way back to this sect whoever they are and you know we're, we're getting to the bottom of it and uh this is uh i'm gonna text this to our buddy owen after this because this is one of the things i saw this would not i would not have gone through the efforts to make this last portion of the book had it not been for the, like the jort wars and the shit leading up to the jort wars <laughs> for those who don't know what that is it's the 
you know, all these it ortho bros and like the, oh, how dare you? These fucking idiots who call themselves Christian. They don't know the first thing about Christianity. They don't even know what the word Christian, Christianos means in Greek. They can't take it apart etymologically. And yet they come around everywhere acting like they're the special boys who know how to read scripture and they don't know a fucking thing. I do know a thing. I spent a long time on this. I come from families that put popes in power, right? One of the families that I'm from is the Conti family. They produced four popes. The only family that produced more popes is the Orsini's, right? So this is in my family, and I would not have even mentioned this shit. But what you fucking scumbags out there were doing to Owen just for questioning how does Jesus pray to himself if he's his own father and if he's God? It's like basic common sense stuff that a child could ask. And these people are like, oh, how dare you? This is not the Trinity. And you're like, where does the Trinity come from? They can't answer. They have no idea about the Trimuti. There's the, the lack of knowledge in these spaces is like equivalent to weeds. And they've overgrown the garden of all the good fruit that came out of this space. And so I believe it is our job. And I, I say I believe because I don't know. But I do believe what we're doing is we're literally weeding out a lot of these trashy creatures, these vile forms. I don't know what to call them, but they are what's restricting everybody in this space from evolving and growing. And, that, and I just wanted to put that out there. Shout out to Owen. Because he took a lot of uh, heat for this. Well, I think he's described it really well, actually, that it's about, you know, the, this this fear that so many men get of not being good enough and trying to figure out a way and latching on to the identity of Christianity and Orthodox Christianity as a way to look at a man who's more driven, more successful, more moral, uh, more higher status, all of that, and find out a way to be, how am I still better than you? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that's what they're looking for. They're trying to figure out the way of how am I still better than you? And at the end of the day, that's what all bullying has always been about of any form. So the fact that it happens in a kind of a collective sense and, you know, he had a big loss of uh, following or loss of, I don't want to say loss of following, loss of some support. It's all good. You know, they're like fleas. Fleas will all fall off. Uh, I really didn't like the Jort Wars. I didn't I didn't particularly watch Owen's streams during all that, but you know, it eventually that ended and it's all all past us now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh and you know, we're it, we'll we'll run into it again. We'll run into it again. Yep. But I think I really appreciate the audience in this channel because I feel like we've done a good job cultivating the uh you know, the right energy that that type of thing does doesn't necessarily get attracted to this channel because to even watch this conversation would challenge all of the deeply held dogmatic beliefs. But you know, out. I I don't even know what the Jort Wars were all about. But I ended it up was, benefiting. It was Owen Benjamin had a debate with made uh -huh. by Jim Bob about. Right. They were going to have a friendly debate about the Trinity, and basically, uh, Jim Bob spiraled and decided to go on like a holy war crusade against Owen after the debate, which was supposed to just be funny. They're supposed to just have a funny roast each other debate. But anyway, it's just That's proof right. of how like toxic this this dogmatic uh, way of thinking is. You know, it it's can, it can super totally toxic. get there. Yeah. Yeah. I I I was not I was not paying any attention, but I managed to benefit uh like third hand uh, without even being fully disclosed. I ended up researching uh what is called uh the neurosis of minor differences. And you know, Sigmund Freud gets <laughs> He gets he gets a lot of credit for writing on this, but it predates him by far. So it's it you know he his name is tagged onto it. But this is the kind of thing that was going on back in uh, in Rome. This neurosis of that minor should have, differences that should have been the title for this. <laughs> it's brilliant. Yes. Hey, really no, quick, shout disputers out to Mr. of Therapeutae Dupery is a fun title. Come on, Mr. Moses said something in the chat though because I'm paying attention. Asceticism yeah, yeah. is the perfect cult because you can always be more guilty of not being poor, dirty, and weak enough. And that wow. is one of the mind fucks that it, you see it in this space. People like get at, upset that you would dare charge currency or some sort of exchange for all the work you did and not give it to them for free. Going back to this like 
unjust communism. It's not like good communism where everybody's producing and like freely trading. It's, it's like, no, I do nothing and you do everything. And you, you know, it's like, it's just really despotism and under different guys, you know? Good point. Good point. Important things to learn from all of it. Brayden's the man. He also sent us a good super chat over on Rockfin. Appreciate you, buddy. It was his recommendation and super chat that got me to start <laughs> decided to start actually teaching myself another language. So I'll, I'm very appreciative. I'm going to keep this train moving, though. We got another Taylor quote to continue because, you know, I wanted to find a lot I'm of having these... fun. I'm going to go make me a pot of coffee because so that way it doesn't hold the show up because I'm talking too much, but I'm enjoying this. <laughs> OK, man, as long as you can still hear us. <laughs> It is most essentially observable that the Essenes or therapeutes, in addition to their monopoly of the art of healing, professed themselves to be eclectics. They held Plato in the highest esteem, though they made no scruple to join with his doctrines, whatever they thought conformable to reason in the tenets and opinions of the other philosophers. So, Basically, you know, to like to kind of put that into more modern language, <laughs> this sect, the eclectics, and we're going to dive into this more closely, but these guys were the syncretists of their time in a way, you know, not exactly the same as what the type of syncretism we do. We're sort of like unraveling the tangled ball of thread that they created with their syncretism. But, you know, how the similarity between all these systems came about, I think it is probably from this Holy Sailors, Etrusco Phoenician navigator, Mason priest class. And then you know, the, the next thing that happens is the height of the empire seems to arise in Egypt. And now we have a bunch of guys sitting around talking philosophy, symposium style in different parts of the world. And the quote here is talking about how Plato is kind of seen as a, a messiah in many philosophical circles. Platonism has so many, so many tendrils and everything, modern science and religion. It's hard to really overstate that. But basically, they, they, it's saying here that they didn't even care um, whether or not the tenants necessarily were internally consistent <laughs> you know um their their system was sort of just like the mma of philosophy back then eclectic and even Amen. when you see the name eclectic and how close that is to ecclesiastic ecclesia eclectic you know it's very close yes so it's so fascinating that you said the mma of philosophy man uh so it uh a lot Way of less people manly though yeah, great. Yeah, in an ironic way. Uh, <laughs> um, so Plato, Plato was his wrestling name. That was literally his, you know, his uh, his luchador uh, persona, and it means broad-shouldered one. Some people say it means he had a really uh, 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 heavy brow. His eyebrows were big because his brain was so full of knowledge. But either way, what's really amazing is it kind of plays into the fact that he was a, a good, uh, he was in the, it wasn't the Olympics then, but it was the equivalent of the Olympics in his time. The fact that he was a renowned fighter and that we call him by his fighting name plays into the claim that he was, uh, he was very Jewish, that this is the foundation of Jewish philosophy. Uh, and in fact that the, you know, the Israelites, they call themselves, their name is those who wrestle with God. And what here you're talking he, about a pugilist. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, Allah, uh, a potuche. Nice. The nice. There, son in Gemini. I don't know. I'm just saying what, you know, what if? Yeah. 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 It's really something to think about the fact that those who wrestle with God, uh, are in one de derivation of history. We're just a bunch of patriarch uh, philosophs circle jerking on around a cookie. <laughs> real, real quick, not to give them too much hate, though. The reason they were eclectic is it's kind of like what we do, where we take the best of everything you come across. So that was like the general. I'm not saying that they always did this, but that was the general overarching idea. They're taking what's good from every tradition all over the world. So there was that. Yeah. So, and honestly, so with any organization of people. And this is a loose organization in the first place. There's 
all types of human expression going on. You know, it's even more ap- accurate to say that even the people that were mostly bad people <laughs> have some good to them. And the people that were mostly good people have some bad to them. So, you know, yeah. I, I, I don't like that. I feel like I have to always reiterate that, but we do. It's not necessarily about good guys and bad guys. It's more like just tracing how we got to where we are so that we don't fall for continue to fall for stuff. But yeah. to say more about the eclectics, their name of eclectics indicated that their divine philosophy was a collection of all the diverging rays of truth, which were scattered through the various systems of pagan and Jewish pe- piety in one into one bright focus that their religion was made up of whatsoever things are true whatsoever things are honest whatsoever things are just whatsoever things are pure whatsoever things are lovely whatsoever things are of good report if there were any virtue and if there were any praise wherever found alike indifferent whether it were derived from saint from savage or from sage Jehovah, Jove, or Lord. So, you know, like, and that, it, there's nothing inherently <laughs> wrong I think with that. he's given us like a wink almost, what he just did there. Saint, Savage, and Sage. Jehovah, Jove, Lord. Jehovah, that's all the same. See, is he doing like a little uh, nod to Savage having something to do with Sage and Saint? That's very likely. Uh, you know, the... Um... Indus constellation is uh, it is a savage, you know. It is it is, uh, and it's been uh, put up in the heavens. It's give it's been given immortality, a station a station in the heavens. It's right there uh, by uh, Pavo down in the South Pole area by Sigma Sigma Octantis. So there is a immortalized savage in the heavens, uh, cosmologically speaking. That's really something. You're right. And it's all in trinities too, right? Well, also the word savage etymologically is said by, you know, the quick <laughs> the quick Google search to be derived from Silvius or Sylvanus, like Sylvan, like pertaining to woods or forests. Yeah, you got to be kidding me. Which is exactly what this sect was about. I was they talking go- about Selvans last time we were doing this, and you couldn't find it. That Etruscan deity, that's where Pan, every all these these, these wood creatures, even Louis was saying how Luca, uh, Lucus or whatever was uh, uh, the woods, and like it's all pertained to these de- deities of like the wilderness and shit. That's crazy. There's some funky. Uh- noise coming through your mic that wasn't there before i don't know if, what's up with that dylan sorry the water's boiling i'll be right back oh, okay it's no biggie their name of ascetics indicated the severe discipline and exercise of self-mortification long fastings prayers contemplation and even making of themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake as did Origen, Melito, and others who derived their Christianity from the same school, and as Christ himself is represented to have recognized and approved their practice. So this image here is of the Indian guy who kept his arm in the air for like, I don't know, 10 plus years. I don't remember how long it was, a long time for world peace. (laughs) <laughs> and on the no hate for this guy, you know, like that's an amazing feat. <laughs> it's actually more of an amazing feat than just being dirty, poor, and hungry than uh, a lot of aesthetics <laughs> have. But the point is, you know, that just was a good picture of uh, to represent the concept. But what this like really is telling us is the origin of the trope of Catholic guilt, you know, that. I, I I see this all the time. Not even Catholics aren't the only ones that have this, but when I'm doing tunings for people all the damn time, I run into this belief of the only way that I can be good is if I'm in suffering, the more I'm suffering, the more good I am. This is what the guilt complex is really all about. And this, I think what the aesthetics kind of put into the cultural ecosystem or they, yeah. you know, they, they nourished something that was already part of human nature in, and made it more uh, pious to do. But I, I swear, I see this all the time, like this belief of, 
you, you know, you see it in like American generation, the American modern generations are like this too. Not the, uh, the younger ones maybe, but the whole no pain, no gain. I'm not saying that pain, you know, chosen appropriately, like working out, like that kind of pain isn't good for you, but pain, I mean, psychological pain, guilt and shame and, and hiding, uh, who you truly are, you know, suffering through terrible circumstances because you've, that's what a good person would do. You know, like that's why people stay in bad, broken relationships. It's, I mean, it just goes on and on. So that guy's looking that, like me in LA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, a, a cult of self-deprecation is a, is a horrific thing to see uh, revealed that it was there all along, you know, just like Dylan was saying, you know, these guys can, uh, you can just outdo each other on how self-loathing you are for eternity. It's like a, a endless fount of of really nasty virtue signaling. Uh, very well, the unhealthy. nastiest is cutting off your wang. Right. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that people are doing that now? It just has a different name. They're not calling it Unix. They're not saying it's for religion, but it is a religion. And this whole like thing that, is a religion. They're trying to be the rebus, that alchemical, like weird. It's like it, it, there is something freaky, like inverted about. Uh, there is an alchemical inversion going on. Yes, yes. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna give a quick little story, uh, a, a personal experience just this last week. And uh, again, my my own personal life is always like a perfect setup for what we're going to talk about on Wednesdays. This is yet again. Here it is. Uh, it was my father's birthday this week. And the day before his birthday, I was listening to Sam Tripoli and Tripoli just dropped a little bit of that Alcoholics Anonymous gnosis, you know, one of, they got so many phrases and one of them is like, oh, everybody thinks they're special. Everybody thinks they're special. And I was like, and it hit me because I've heard my old man say that before. And I'm like, you know what? And I'm just in my mind, I'm having the conversation with my dad that even though he's not here, I'm like, you are special, asshole. You're my fucking dad. And that makes you special. What the fuck? Who are you to think you're not fucking special? What does that make me if you're not fucking special, asshole? So I have this whole debate with my father. I go to sleep and I have a heavy fucking dream. I have a really heavy dream about him in a retirement home, sitting alone in a corner and all more morbid and in a dark shadow. Everybody else in the room is getting along playing games. And I come up behind him and I pat him on the shoulder and he starts to cry. And I have to like lock eyes with him and, and convince him uh, without words. It was like a silent dream. Just look him in the eyes and be like, You're fucking special dickhead, you know? And uh, sure enough, I didn't realize it when I had that dream and that, that whole d conversation with myself, I didn't realize it. It was the day before his birthday. And it dawned on me the next day. I was like, wh I wasn't even thinking about that. And that's part of the weight of why, uh, he came to, you know, we came together in our sleep. And so that's the kind of twisted side effects of that kind of aestheticism of like mm -hmm. self-loathing as an economy, it bleeds onto the people around you. Uh, We're not even talking about like all the flagellation practices and has your yourself dad, and has your dad passed on? No, no. Oh, I, so we talked. We, yeah. So he, did, it, did it manifest in real life? Like, did you? I, I told him. I told him about the dream and I, uh, for his birthday. I was like, dude, you gotta, you gotta realize, you really mean a lot to me. You know what I mean? Uh, so, yeah, it was, it was very fascinating because the the birthday thing was not on my mind, but it, clearly I was tuning into it, you know, on some level. Uh, and so, yeah, I got to bring that forward. But isn't that something to think about in relation to what we're talking about now? You know, people get together, they get a whole cult of people who are like, no, we're nobody's special, nobody's special. And they're all patting themselves on the back for saying everybody's a fucking number. And then you look at the side effects of that long term, you know, it magnifies over time. Uh, so, yeah, I thought I'd just throw that on the table while we're talking about it. Yeah, that's a great example. All right. Now I'm going to continue us on the slides, though. We have St. Mark, the evangelist, is said to have been sent into Egypt and have preached the same gospel which he afterwards committed to writing. <laughs> Think a bunch of guys in the 
in uh, the Middle East were named Mark and Luke and John. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. Anyway, there he established the churches of Alexandria. And so great was the number of both men and women that became believers of his first address on account of the more philosophical and intense asceticism, which he both taught and practiced, that Philo has, set, has seen fit to write a history of their manner of living, their assemblies, their sacred feasts, and their whole course of life. And... Now we'll get into a quote from Johann Lorenz von Moshim. Moshem? <laughs> Sounds like Moshe. It was in Egypt that the morose and the morose discipline of asceticism took its rise, and it is observable that that country has, in all times, as it were by an immutable law or disposition of nature, abounded with persons of a melancholy complexion and produced, in proportion to its extent, more gloomy spirits than any other part of the world. It was here that the Essenes dwelt principally, long before the coming of Christ. And then Taylor says, The principal seat of this philosophy was at Alexandria, and it manifestly appears, says Moshim, from the testimony of Philo the Jew, who was himself one of this sect that was in a flourishing state at Alexandria when our savior was upon the earth. So we're going to get into the Alexandria thing. I'm going to just go through a few more slides. Can I just uh, comment real quick? I'll make it quick. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to even be quick. So you mentioned Mark. It's an exclusively Latin name. Marcos in Greek doesn't come along till way after. And where will you see this? You go right into Venice, Venetian, Venus, right? And you have Piazzetta de San Marco, St. Mark's Cathedral, and it is the lion. And, and it's Regulus. And one of the things that... You see the lion hiding in the background here? Yep. Nice. And, and one of the things that I did that he didn't do is if you were to only read Robert Taylor, you would get the royal stars mixed up. Because he said that um, St. Mark was actually Fomalhaut and corresponding to the, the, the winter sign rather than uh, summer, Leo. And that was because, and so because I was able to do that, that's, you know, I obviously had access to images all over the world and could do everything where he couldn't in his confines. So, that's one of the things as good as um, his work is, it is important to do the work. Right. And sometimes people make mistakes and they don't realize they've made the mistakes and they don't have the means to correct themselves or to fact check themselves, you know? So we're very fortunate that we have these tools at our disposal. So I just wanted to say that, you know, like people who read spirit world, they'll, they'll, they'll get that right. Nice. Yeah, man. Big up on that. That is important. You know, and things like that, you, uh, you got to test them out yourself. Uh, and that's the, and that's the joy of the age that we're in with all this information, you can access so many ways of testing out these ideas. So would, uh, FOMO Hall have ended up being John? Uh, no, it would have been, uh, well, he, it would, it's what Matthew is, but John, the okay. so there's John the Baptist and there's John the evangelist. And so oh, okay. there's, okay. there's two Johns, there's two James, there's four Marys, there's two Judas. That... Oh, there's uh, there's the Joseph that is Jesus' stepdad, and then there's the Joseph that puts Jesus in the tomb and is there at the crucifixion. Yeah, it's because, I think it's because of the Lumashi of it all, that the original script that the scriptures are transcribed from is the stars, and so the names of stars and puns in their names is where the actual writing is coming from and actually the naming and conventions are coming from. And a lot right. of times it might not seem evident, but it comes down to like, what does the name mean? Uh, like as a etymological meaning, like Mary, Miriam, the Hebrew word Miriam, meaning bitter sea. And uh, <laughs> that's why I really like John McHugh's work because he shows that from the Babylonian Sumerian context. And I think that 
it's something that could potentially be extrapolated out to different parts of the world. And, you know, we'll, as we'll see going forward, if, if these uh, Essenes, Therapeute, this college uh, that we're about to kind of crack open, if part of their coursework was to create their own alphabets, why wouldn't it also be to create their own scripture, to transcribe their own astrotheological narratives? I think that that's in the mix for sure. Um, and then the monks, the name, their name of monks indicated their delight in solitude. Ironically, <laughs> you know, most of the time you Google the picture of monks, you see like hundreds of them <laughs> all together. <laughs> <laughs> That's the irony of this collectivism aspect of this is that, you know, there, it's a big collectivist thing. You might be, you know, you might be in your little pod living in your pod home next to a, a bunch of other pods. But in a way, you're like really alone. No, you know, you don't really get to be your true self. So you feel more alone than somebody who is actually physically alone, but fully themselves, fully healthy, fully in tune with nature. Anyway, their delight in solitude, their contemplative life, their entire segregation and abstraction from the world, which Christ in the gospel is in like manner represented as describing as characteristic of the community, which he himself was a member. And then we have Eusebius, the father of ecclesiastical history. Real quick, did you yeah, see that orange? It. You see that orange he's wearing? Yeah. I want everybody, I'm going to post a link in the chat. It's called flamium. That's a color in that the, the priest of Jupiter would be, oh, fuck, the, the link is to, uh, I'll just type the word in. So that yes. You know, Google. That's a color of fidelity. That's the, they, they wear that in Roman marriages too because they weren't allowed to get divorced. So it's something important to keep in mind. You see this, going back to this, where is it coming from? It's this obvious sway, but how is it getting from the East to Rome if certain priests class, classes aren't allowed to go beyond a certain point? But the navigators, well, they're getting hired by the Egyptians to go straight into the Red Sea all around and straight into India, you know? So I think that's the common denominator for a lot of this diffusion. Nice. Great weave. So Eusebius, the father of ecclesiastical history, one of the original church fathers, Pateres, he says that he's talking about Philo, talking about the Therapeutae. He says, Philo wrote also a treatise on the contemplative life or the worshipers from whence we have borrowed those things which we allege concerning the manner of life of those apostolical men. Those ancient therapeutae were Christians, and at their ancient writings were our gospels and epistles. That alone should just be the end of the conversation in terms of like <laughs> the historicity of, of uh, the, the church system. It's ridiculous. <laughs> and then their name of ecclesiastics, was of the same sense and indicated their being called out, elected, separated from the general fraternity of mankind and set apart to the more immediate service and honor of God. I think the modern uh, churchians have it backwards. You know, the ecclesiastics are supposed to be the ones called out by God, but they seem to be the ones that are super into doing call outs. <laughs> <laughs> they liked I'm calling I'm doing a call out video call it's all just you, sir it's all just clout chasing uh bullshit but you know that's I, I, that's my joke about it shout out to gamma extracts you fucking phage <laughs> okay so next slide oh got my powerpoint mixed up all right this admission, he is referring to Eusebius, this admission of the great ecclesiastical historian, says Robert Taylor, than whom there is no greater, will serve us as the Pythagorean theorem, the great geometrical element of all subsequent science, of continual recurrence, of infinite application, ever to be born in mind, always to be brought in proof, presenting the means of solving every difficulty. 
and the clue for guiding us to every truth. Bind it about thy neck, write it upon the tablet of thy heart. Everything of Christianity is of Egyptian origin. That is definitely <laughs> the theorem to hold on to. I really like how he puts that. Uh, you know, there's another thing he says about it uh, later on. I want to find. So you guys comment on this. I'm just thinking like, here, here's the deal. The architecture in Egypt is superb if it's authentic. Some of these places, uh, there's no hieroglyphics there. There's it, The ancient culture in Egypt is something remarkable. But what existed with the Greek mixture, whatever's going on leading up to this like turn of the millennium, it's fucking dark. And I think that is part of our journey. Maybe not the three of ours, but maybe people in the audience that our work will help inspire or just, you know, recalibrate their mind to see things a little bit differently. I think some people are going to crack that code of what actually was going on in Egypt if it's authentic and it's as old as it is. Rem rem remember this because I'm not going to tell you all the details, but I've got a secret mystery slide that Chance has prepared that will blow your fucking mind. And again, there's something going on that we don't know about Egypt that is connected to ancient Italy and ancient India. And it is that trade route and it is re related to Herodotus admitting he Herodotus didn't believe the account. He admitted that he didn't believe the account, but he's like, well, they sit, they sailed around Africa in two years and they got around the horn of Africa, or the Cape Horn or whatever the hell it's called. And they said the sun was on the right side which means they were in the southern part of the equator, you know, south of the equator, proverbial. Um, there's something going on in this fucking place for everybody to keep mentioning, like that melancholy disposition, all the spiritual, you know, uh, the um, that Turkish spy called it the, uh, the mistress of... Oh, damn, I'll, I'll have to look it up. But there's a lot of names for Egypt that it is like the mother of all the mystery schools. And I think if it's good, the corruption of those, whatever happened with the corruption is what turned it into something dark and wicked that yeah. really pervaded Europe. I don't think it was all bad, though. I think a lot of the mist because, you know, you guys know some of this shit, when you look at it, it actually helps you like. It brings you closer to nature. It brings you closer to God. Or, or for me, it did. I don't want to speak for you guys, but for me, it, like it really does help you reckon all these other ideas of what this world could be. Yeah. So I don't think it's all bad. Well, uh, you know, you're you're mentioning this. The mistress uh, made it made me think of the fact that the, you know the Alexandria was arranged with like a, a, a sanctum, an inner sanctum of the uh, museum was like, had real strict regulations, couldn't bring books outside of a certain territory. And then they had the daughter of that was the seraphim uh, or the seraphim. They called it the ser seraphim. And that was, they keep calling that the daughter of the more restrictive space. And that was like the public library version. Uh, so that comes to mind when you mention uh, the daughter or that it's feminine, you know, that it has a feminine quality. And we know that they're lovers of Sophia. Sophia is depicted as a woman, uh, is a, a, a knowledge that you can love, that you can have affection for. She was called the midwife of celestial secrets. That's what the Arabs called her. <clears throat> Damn, that was Socrates' handle. They called him the midwife of philosophy. Or the, the yeah the midwife of philosophy, or the midwife of yeah of philosophy. That's interesting. That midwife thing. So the the principal matriarchal muse of the nine muses was Calliope, and so she would be the midwife of all the muses. And I've i found her hiding out behind the stories of Plato. He's not telling us outright. You have to do all this experimentation like you did with the with the royal stars. And you find out that there are corresponding representatives behind him. So Calliope is the muse hiding behind Socrates. So that's fascinating that uh, they're both called midwives.
Yeah, and I, I could have put it on the list before, but Gnostics would fit on that list of sects or titles of groups that are part of this whole system. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so would probably Epicureans, Sto I think Stoics. You know, it, it's got a lot of branches, and some mm -hmm. of them have, they take it in their own direction. There's cultural differences, sure. But I think that, you know, we're going to get into the, the Alexandrian bit now. But All right. Good chance. Did you make a slide about the difference between the philosophers and uh, the Gnostics? No, Is not specifically. Not? Okay. So just for, for, you know, just to like give people an idea. So basically the Greek and Roman mode of thought and reasoning was designed by the simple title of philosophy and that of the Eastern nations as opposed to it was called Gnosticism. So the philosophy signified only the love and pursuit of wisdom, whereas the Gnosis signified the perfection and full attainment of wisdom itself. That's the difference. Nice. Not Important. inherently bad either way. Just. Yep. So the oldest manuscripts of the Bible, uh, the Alexandrian codices, codices are what Taylor references in his writing. But the same year as his death, the Codex Sinaiticus, <laughs> Sinaiticus was found. And so he wasn't aware of that, you know, when he also it's claimed the date of the fourth century be, um, common era. I don't have the research or the knowledge equipped to maybe dispute that, but it is a claim, you know, as far as everything this old, I, I'd say at best it's a claim. They have maybe a good claim to it because of the Alexandrian type set style. But the point being that the oldest Bible manuscripts that we've got that have the Old and New Testament together in Greek are both from Egypt. You know, Sinai is in Egypt. <laughs> so, you know, is, is that not important? I think that's important. I like what you did with the dates, though, because you know me with when stuff is found. I have I have like a serious blockage when I'm like 1844. Are you kidding me? Yeah, that's when f forgery and fakery got a lot more popular. Definitely at that time. But, you know, that's at least an impressive amount of work to do that with a whole Bible. <laughs> a lot and of you can tell if it's <laughs> fake or not. Like somebody will be able to go through that and pick out words. And, you know, sometimes even one little word will give it away. So, you know, I was doing research on it and found that some of the transcription errors and things that you'd find in like other Bible manuscripts of a comparable age were all there. So. It, it seems legit enough, but still, this is the 4th century, 5th century common era, oldest Bibles we got. <laughs> Everything that is claimed to be older than that, it's like a little scrap of a scrap of paper where you can just barely make out a few lines. And there is a, a Codex Vaticanus, <laughs> but uh, I'm not even, I don't even care about that. <laughs> it's still in Greek. It's, you know, it's similar to this. The point being that it's it's Alexandria that this stuff is coming from. And let's see here. Next slide. This is, I think, where it gets juicy. The first and greatest library that ever was in the world was at Alexandria in Egypt. The first of that most mischievous of all institutions, universities, was the University of Alexandria in Egypt where lazy monks and wily fanatics first found the benefit of clubbing together to keep the privileges and advantages of learning to themselves and concocting holy mysteries and inspired legends to be dealt out as the craft should need for the, per for the perpetuation of ignorance and superstition and consequently of the ascendancy of jugglers and Jesuits holy hypocrites and reverend rogues among men. Taylor's just like, he's, he's vicious, man. He goes for the juggler with the, he calling them jugglers, but that's actually what? juggler is a, a term for a magi or a magician. In some versions of the major arcana, the magician card is called the juggler. So, wow. Uh, and what's up Rose triple seven. Good to see you. Yeah. Nice. Hey Rose. So this is a, a big quote, but, you know, this isn't just coming from Taylor. It's just Taylor describes it so well. 
we're looking at the <laughs> what is causing so much havoc in the world right now in the west is it the universities <laughs> you know i think what we're seeing how like there's a specialized trade or craft there's a university for it and then the members or the graduates you know they got the degrees they go out to what do they call it in secret societies degrees <laughs> they go they go from their university or from their center out to different parts of the world i think this is where we see all of the diffusion um i i think we this is a major source of diffusion i'm not saying alexandria in egypt is the source of the mythology or the system but it's where this eclecticism you know I, it, what it looks like to me is that the holy sailors call them phoenicians call them Etrurians, call them what you will took their system from place to place as they did their trading operations they needed this astrology astronomy for their navigating purposes and they're also the masons they're building edifices temples teaching that and then then the eclecticism comes later where these philosophers lovers of wisdom are now trying to grab all the different parts of the system that they can find anywhere that they can find them bring them all together and refine them into something that they would consider to be like the penultimate refinement of it all and that's you know when you look at them the mainstream the, you know story about christianity you know at the early times there's all these offshoots that have much similarity to paganism and the modern christian scholar will say that the those offshoots were corruptions of christianity but actually christianity is like a simplification or corruption of those other branches in my opinion like so a lot of what is said about this is backwards that the <laughs> does that does that make sense maybe dylan can spell it out a little better why are you relying on me because <laughs> you know Shit. you wrote the books on it no I what what's the question you have? I was I was in the chat. Well, I was talking about how the modern scholars of Christianity will say that those offshoots in the early years that have a lot of pagan pomp oh, yeah. and ceremony they deny that they deny they'll, they'll say that those are corruptions of Christianity. But actually, it's the other way around. Christianity comes from those type of systems and is a, a simplification, maybe or refinement dogmatism of them. 100%, that, which is why you will find no evidence, no artifacts, nothing when you need it the most in the first century when this stuff is alleged to exist. But you will find the pillar of the boatman with Isis, right? With Cernunos, when he has the crab horns, just like Pontos before he was, he was given the stag horns from the people who went inland. And you will see Isis, it's another god of war, you have this martial archetype and this whole system is based on martial law, if you will. Right. And uh, so the, the only things that you can find in the time where this stuff would have been most relevant, you find the stuff that it's borrowed from. And that is, that's what you see in every, it's not just Christianity. Every industry does this. They constantly invert and so when you're learning, you know, I hate to be this guy, but this is what I've learned is the more I looked into every single lie that has been fed to us, it's not just that they lied. It's usually that they did the exact opposite of what the truth is. Almost as it, it's their way of reckoning their lies so they don't get lost in their own lies. It's very, it's, I don't know how to explain yes. it, but that's what it looks no, like. I think, I think you're spot on. I would even say that by, by inverting it completely, it almost becomes like a, a call sign or a gang sign for future generations to flash in public that they're on the know of what really did happen. And the the Alexand the the burning of Alexandria is absolutely one of them. You know, uh, I'm seeing this theme of the burning of a tower. And I'm seeing it uh, happening in, historically, you know, these, these actual towers, the Bastille, you know, that really happened. The Lisbon disaster, those, these things really happened. But then I'm seeing philosophers and influential people who have turned, uh, like, literally pivoted history on a dime on, in their lifetime. They're also uh, using these terms, like Martin Luther, he had a tower moment. He literally calls it that, where he's in a high tower and he has an epiphany where he 
uh, he feels uh, hatred towards God, and it turns his life in that one single moment. And all of these guys are using the tower as a hallmark of like this coming to Jesus experience. And all of it, w- what we're doing is laying out the chronology of it, and it goes back to this, uh, the Alexandria, Pharos. You know, it's, the word Pharos means lighthouse. It's the tower. And also, uh, it, it can be also construed to be the row and fat, uh, fat, like the friend of the grain. Like the difference between a pharaoh and a shepherd is he provides, but he doesn't like tend the flock. He shows yeah. you where to get the, he provides the grain for you. But what you were just saying, Gabe, as Chance puts up this next quote, it's the, the White House, the White House, the fucking Alexandria. And what if, guys, this is like, okay, this is me in the woo, but have you guys ever looked into what Alexandria is in the lighthouse? All that stuff's underwater now. So they speculate some sort of um, volcano or earthquake or something caused a tsunami that like flooded the city of Alexandria and wiped all this stuff out. And I wonder if that tower card, because isn't the tower card the thing like breaking and people are falling out of it? I yep. wonder if it goes back to what they think happened with the lighthouse. Yes, I, I'm, I'm starting sus- to suspect it very much does. It's so fascinating. You know, and I had a, I was trying to find receipts for the show on this. Uh, it, was a, it was a big dig I did a while ago, and I'm going to kind of miss some of the details, but I have the gist of it correct. But I was reading a, a modern day analysis of uh, people who give speeches. And there were three components to the psychology of a speech today to a politician. They get up on a high pulpit and they give you these uh, these three ingredients, uh, one of which is like, first of all, they they put a hazard on your uh, their opponents. They say, if you go over there, you're going to hit a rock. But if you come over to me, I'm going to lead you in the right direction. And they're literally appealing to the uh, amygdala of the brain. And they're putting a light in your mind for the hope of the future with uh, their promises. And all the anatomy of the speech making is the anatomy of an Alexandrian lighthouse. They even talk about the three-part anatomy of the human brain. Well, all lighthouses have three uh, sections stacked on top of each other. They're pointing out the hazards of where not to go for ships. Don't go over in the shallow waters. Come over here in the light waters. Uh, And then the light and the imagination of the brain of the pineal was literally all baked into the art of speechcraft that politicians do today. And that's a amygdala is a magdala literally means a strong tower. They're literally calling the anatomy of your brain to the lighthouse of the pharaohs. Yeah, it's so profound. It's is so your, profound. Is your eye on? That's the ionic pillar, yes. you know? Yeah. Pointing to that eye, you know, whatever. Yep. And I was, I was, uh, uh, also, I was reading that you were mentioning, uh, Dylan, you mentioned that um, I think it's the A is often con- conflated with the F, the P is often with the row, and then the W is often, you know, these are like linguistical. Uh, yeah. it's change ups. Well, th- that literally spells P Rho W spells Pharaohs, the Pharaohs that spells the lighthouse. So, the ingredients oh, wow. of the ingredients of the list linguistical change ups spells like fer- call it the lock picking. That's it. Yeah, I, but I I think, lock picking. You know, we've got some slides on that. What, the, what if that is the Tower of Babel, that type I'm, of lighthouse? Like, what if that was it? <laughs> Sorry, it's so, man. Where you're going. It's uh, so fascinating. There's so much it, consistency. And then one more thing I just got to point out that I just realized this week was right in the middle of Joe Robinette Biden's name is Joseph Ferro Bennett Biden. Joseph P-H-R-O. He has the P-H-R-O in his name. And that's very significant to me because I'm putting him right next to the moon card. Uh, which has two lighthouses on it in my pro- in my project right now. Uh, so I just thought I'd throw that in the weave too, because these guys are totally ca- hailing back to the pharaohs, but not in the, well, both in the aspect of the pharaoh, you know, the sacred bloodlines, but also 
as these strong towers or these guiding lights of the consciousness of man. That was a pretty cool weave. I know where Chance is like, we got to keep going, but no, 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 no. <laughs> I, cool. I want to add to the weave actually, because I've got, I'm, I'm super into it. <laughs> the the <laughs> hero, the, good one. the hero, right? Cairo. Cairo. Yes. I am of the opinion that kind of similar to the rule of Kellel and Gematria, that there are some instances where dropping the first letter off of a name might tell you something, you know, Ptolemy, they don't even pronounce the P in Ptolemy, right? So if you drop the P off of Pharaoh, you've uh, H A and then Rho, that's not that far off, you know, Hero. Hero. Hare. Hare. <laughs> so that's fun. <laughs> yeah, this is why tickets to the slick gun show are worth it. <laughs> Thor hammer <laughs> mic drop. <laughs> yeah, this is why this is why we have you on the team, buddy. Nobody ever <laughs> uh nobody sees things that you see, dude. But I've had this slide up for a long time. I'm gonna read it. Yeah, I just brought it up early because like you start talking about tower moments and that's the very next slide. <laughs> Couldn't believe that it. Pretty on point. They had a flourishing university or corporate body established on these principles. You know, the principles we're referring to would be, you know, what we we're just talking about with, uh, <laughs> well, just continue these principles we've been talking about, right? Long, uh, in Egypt, in Alexandria, long before the period assigned to the birth of Christ, from this body, they sent out missionaries and had established colonies, auxiliary branches, and affiliated communities in various cities of Asia Minor, which colonies were in a flourishing condition before the preaching of St. Paul. Important. This is what I, I think this is the keys to this, to what we see going on in the world right now. This is like where the marching orders were given out. You know, this is the Tavistock Institute of the day or whatever you want to call it. This is um, continuing with what Taylor has to say in those. Er now we're going to get into the, the medicine part because this is so important to, you know, I think they've realized even more so than ever the days out there how important it is to leverage this idea of health and make it a religious uh, question. And they've done it in a, a weird secular way where now it's like the God is the white lab coat <laughs> rather than a divinity. But in those early times, Taylor says, the professions of medicine and divinity were inseparable. We read of the divinity students studying medicine in the school or university of Alexandria to which all persons resorted who were afterwards to practice in either way on the weak in body or the weak in mind among their fellow creatures. The therapeutes or Essenes, as their name signifies, were expressly professors of the art of healing, an art in those days necessarily conferred, conferring the most mystical uh, sanctity of charity on all who were endued with it and the most convenient of all others for the purposes of imposture and wonderment. So <laughs> one thing that he says about this is how, <laughs> well, okay. So he brings up how Taylor talks about how <laughs> there's no need for like knowledge of anatomy. There's no need for any, there, there also is a big deal of secrecy of like how, um, how the medicine that's being prescribed works or what's in it. We see all that today, you know, like patents on your, your prescription pills, all of that is still going on. And so what I think has gone on is like, just as we see in modern times, right? There is something spiritual about health. I mean, everything about health is spiritual in my experience, in my, in my opinion, that, that is actually facts, factual. Medicine and divinity are inseparable in truth. I think this is all stemming out of real discoveries and real effective, you know, folk knowledge, if you will. But there's this new system that comes up in Alexandria, or how new it is, I'm not sure, of gatekeeping the knowledge of how this all works and making it about 
having the credentials before you're allowed to do it. That's a big part. Like <laughs> what happens today if you go and make claims about health or or what I can cure cancer or whatever, you know, you can get sent to jail in modern times if you don't have the credentials or the authority invested in you by letters after your name. And as he says here, those who after due training in the ascetic discipline were sent out from the University of Alexandria to practice their divinely acquired art in the towns and villages were recognized as regular or canonical apostles, while those who had not obtained their credentials from the college who set up for themselves or who after having left the college ceased to recognize its appointment were called false apostles, quacks, heretics, and empirics. This is, uh, I think this is the origin even of the Romish <laughs> church, you know, uh, Paul. <laughs> Paul, I think, is one of these heretics or apostles. He's wanting to set up his own version of the system, right? Any comments, gentlemen? Yeah, man, I well, think you're right. Uh, a lot of, one of the things that kind of was the precursor to the Jort Wars was, uh, Owen not realizing that most Christians are Paulites. Mm. And he was all up in the Kool-Aid and didn't know the flavor. <laughs> you know, that, that's what you're dealing with. And one of the things that um, I expose in this and that other people found this, it's not just like my work, but you look at like even Reverend Taylor said, uh, the idea of Paul writing an epistle to the Romans in Greek is it's like a, he called it a violation. No, no violence to the imagination. It'd be like addressing people in London in Arabic. Right. And people will come back with that and say, well, there is, uh, he was, he was initiated and he was communicating to the initiated of Rome. Right. Like that kind of nonsense. But other very smart church people saw that uh, there were words. I'll write it down for you and just hold it up. That um, it betrays this concept is, um, sorry, my writing sucks. If you can see that, agion, right? Agios, this, this pertains to martyrdom and stuff like that. So there's words that are in that letter that couldn't have been in there prior to the end of the second century and beginning of the third century, which is problematic because the claim is that it's from the first century. And what I think is the letter probably didn't even get written until the fourth century because that's when the church made its move. That is like the big, it's go time. We're going to Christianity now. You know, and that's why you don't really find any evidence of this shit existing prior to those, uh, the fourth century. And that's right around the Nicene Creed. Am I right? Yes. Yes. There is, there is so much to what the Nicene Creed still means today, because right now the East and the West are going head to head. You mean you Dionysian? I mean? Dionysian? Exactly. Dionysian Creed. Yes, that's right. That is totally right. Yeah, in that, uh, I mean, there's so much more to it. Like, it's 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 all its own thing. But uh, essentially, like the uh, West preserved, from what I'm guessing, they preserved some claim to the birthright of kings, having some sanguinity to a Christ or some sanguinity to their savior of their flavor, uh, and that is what the West preserved in the east is like no that's not how it works and now here we are we're about to start you know people's going to start blowing each other up and it's going to be east versus west you know a biggie versus tupac <laughs> fucking scary yeah it is man you know, like fucking... i hate war i absolutely hate war and i i really yeah. I, I don't hate people but something that probably gets me irked more than anybody else is the idea of a justified war and when you look at all the non-combatants and innocent people that have their lives ruined and killed in war, it, it doesn't matter to me. It's not justifiable under any circumstances. That really bothers me. Right, right. I just heard a phrase today, Dylan, um, 
that wartime is the winter reprieve of culture. And it's so fascinating what that means. It's, it blows my mind how one sentence can pack in so much meaning. But during war, people don't have time for high culture and high mindedness for the preservation of their of their practices. You know what I mean? And it has to go take on the back burner. And in fact, it's kind of like if you let's say you're a musician or a, any kind of artist, if if it's time to go blow people up, people are going to put you on the hot seat for doing your art, you know, uh, because it uh, it requires room. It requires space and uh, uh, I don't know, but yeah, it's terrifying to think about. You just said something so important, Gabe, that I never, I don't stress enough, but I probably should mention this more. Um, I got this, I learned this from Archbishop Richard Trench and he said, the thing that destroys language the most and every time we look at it throughout history is civil war. Nothing screws us up worse in our language up work to, to it becomes irrecoverable to what it was before the civil war yeah man narcissism of small differences <laughs> it right really there. is a beautiful i've never this is the first time i've ever heard that and that really is a beautiful phrase to describe you know people actually like hating each other for stuff that doesn't really matter and if they knew the scope of it's like an offshoot of the dunning kruger effect too yes good call <laughs> like part of the the narcissism of the small differences is the, the they know so little about what they're arguing about that when there's even a slight sh change in the other person's opinion from what they do know or they do believe it's like you sir <laughs> they just yes. go crazy yeah i think it is definitely done in kruger related the right it's it's, it's adjacent yep and then that's why the I rest on the uh, experts. Like, if I if this were just me coming up with this shit, it would not be good, right? That's why I'm very careful on who I rely on. You know what I mean? So that like it's unassailable. Who are you gonna come yeah. at? You see, I have CB. Sorry, I always pronounce that wrong. Because did you know? I just learned this, Gabe, because you study a lot of Greek. Did you know when that upsilon is accented with the U, it's no longer like U. It's it acts like an F. Epsilon. Turns also, into it. Yeah, the, the, the U with the little accent on it with the E in front, like so E, like Eusebius, E U. Yeah. It's, it's like F, E F, like, like F Cebius. That is wow. a trick. I just learned well, that. Then that, that also puts more ammunition behind the swapping of the letters S and F being interchangeable. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Which flick I dissident. totally interrupted, Gabe. Though I'm so sorry. I, no, I, that's all good. I'm no, going to call you film, flick diffident. <laughs> <laughs> flick diffident. You know, another thing about the FS is the inceptionary. They're both a uh, six. So they not only there is a, uh, a what is that? Geo. What am I thinking? Gematria. There's a gematriological basis for it. Inceptionary. I don't think I included it in, in the slides here, but there is... Uh, Hickens talks about how the, <laughs> the this these like initiates or whatever, or graduates of the College of Alexandria were creating their own alphabets, and it the powers of notation is what kind of ties them all together, lets you know that they're coming from the same place. And that anyway, that's a side weave. I'm going to keep pushing forward on the slides. We're getting there, guys. We're doing really good. Yeah, doing buddy. great. Four and... John. D Dylan, have you ever heard that um, a scene relates to – this is out of left field. I'll run it by you. Have you ever heard the term a scene relating to a king bee? Like a male alpha bumblebee, does that ever come across your radar? No, that never that never has. But um, keep if you find anything that yeah, definitely bring that yeah. up next time because it's weird because in Latin a piece is a bee, yeah, but a piece is the bull. In uh, 
Egypt, right? So it, it, there's this correlation with the bee and lordship. Yes. And like rulership yes. and sun symbol, whatever. And that's where you see that beehive and the bee with like Freemasonry symbolism. So that would yeah. be really interesting if you could uh, pull up some info on that. Yeah. And it definitely, it also may, I mean, it, it, like you said, the crowning, it makes me think of the tripartite crown of the Pope and a beehive, the way that, uh, you know, the classic beehive is like a, you know, stacked rings on top of each other. Just, uh, yeah, and, just and so Essene is, uh, that's like the, uh, it's the Egyptian word for healer, right? So, or miracle worker, whatever. So what if that is kind of related to like the miracle, like self-healing structure of the beehive that the bees do when they, right. work, they don't realize what they're building. But when we look at it, it's like this amazing construct yes. with like hexagrams and all that. Right. And it kind of, it came to mind when we were looking earlier in the slides, there was a, a scribe in, in the library uh, and he's putting all those uh, scrolls in different uh, little cubbies. And it absolutely made me think about bees storing, you know, essence, uh, es exactly essential, it. yeah, it's essential so knowledge. I yes, like if the they most designed it like that. What if they designed it like that? Because they knew the bees did it. Yeah, I really, I wonder. Because uh, that honey a... is the Ambrose, that nectar of the gods type, that amber. Yes, you might be onto something, dude. The yeah, savant, man, I love... savant has come out. <laughs> <laughs> hey, real quick, because you just mentioned Alexandria, there was a really good comment in the, the, the in my latest Crow episode. And the guy was saying, like, they took a bunch of shit from the, uh, uh, I think, the Vatican during the French Empire and brought it to France. And then at some point later on, it got decided to bring them back to the Vatican Library. But shit was like sold off and stuff along the way. People are making a serious profit off of that. So that's another thing to be mindful of, you know, when documents, if they should emerge or whatever, you know, maybe it's not forgery. Maybe it literally was taken and sold off. Who knows? It's just one of those things to put out there. I'm still thinking about the FS switch. <laughs> Is it euphibious? No, it's because of all the no, fibs. No, 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 it's do the F. fibs do the fibs of the fathers carry over to the son? The fibs of the fathers. I can't help myself. No, it's the fins because they're water, they're maritime admiralty sailors. Yeah, the top daddy's got the a fins. fish hat and everything. Yeah. Okay, so now we need to talk a little bit more about the the healer healer type thing okay reverend robert taylor unaided by the lights of anatomy and unfounded on any principles of rational science recovery from disease could only be ascribed to supernatural powers a fever was supposed to be a demon that had taken up his abode in the body of the unfortunate patient and was to be expelled not by any virtue of material causes but by incantations spells and leucomancy or white magic as opposed to necromancy or black magic wh by which diseases and evils of all sorts were believed to be incurred. So Taylor comes at it with a tone of like, you know, almost uh scientism tone, <laughs> you know, like it, everything should have a material component. And I'm not saying there isn't a material component, but sorry, my dog is licking my legs out of the room, buddy, out of the room. <laughs> Well, out of the room. It's, it's interesting because you see this like that is the miracle work. It's like this putting fear into everybody and then selling them a miracle cure. And that's what pharmacaea is. You got this problem. We've got a pill for that. Don't worry about the side effects. We've got pills for that. You know, it's like this constant. Like, and don't even worry about how it works. You know, we have the ingredients patented. It's secret. <laughs> right. And they've got a placebo effect it gives them like a 45 to 50 percent advantage. You know, they get they get to lay claim to just that as well. <laughs> so I I am going to push back a little bit against the tone of Taylor here that I think that these ideas came from valid metaphorical descriptions of what goes on in the body like even the idea of 
demons. I mean, when we talk about our gut biome, if your gut biome is off, isn't that, you know, if you have a gut biome that's doing harm to you, isn't that kind of like having a legion of little demonic invisible be life forms that are affecting you? It, when we talk about bacteria that you can't see and most of us have never looked at under a microscope, is it that different than the idea of demons? No. But the point is uh, that <laughs> it's this gatekeeping aspect that um, and also the sort of removal of the material causes. You know, I think the healthy approach is to have both at once. But to continue on, you know, what this is really leading us to is to talk more about how Christianity is asceticism. You also got to remember he's rotting in a prison. Yeah, exactly. So exactly. So there's the, you know, that. Yeah, I, I understand where he's coming from. He's kind of the pendulum is swinging a little too far the other way because he's like rejecting this, the corruption that has put him in jail. And it also like we read it, you know, like he, he might have been fucking laughing his ass off writing this, like just being like, to you know, like he might have been having the time of his life. But without that context, you know, it just comes across as like really <laughs> bitter, which I, I wouldn't blame him. But it, we've been at this for a little while and I haven't heard it. Maybe I missed it. But uh, do you guys remember the last time we got together? You met, you brought up something that said. It had the word Piacenza in it. It was a it was a location somewhere in Italy. And I said, that looks like a, that, I thought it said something else. But turns out that town in Italy, its Latin name is Placentia. Oh, snap. <laughs> An hour, 49 minutes, 29 seconds. I had to. Oh, snap. Okay. Everybody had the placenta pole. I'll type it in the chat game. I'll say I put a wiki. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, man. So, uh. Just today, it, it dawns on me if you if if you grant me the L to R switch, the word president is an anagram for placenta, and that is so profound because uh, I have had a, I mean, a lot of people believe that the president is like a a voodoo doll for the collective. That's what the king is. The king is like a voodoo doll for the health of the collective. And it's just so fascinating to have this externalization of your authority being put on a stage and treated one way or another. You know, right now we got this dimwit in position and we're all talking smack about him. But in a strange way, we're talking about the zeitgeist. And that, and that does have an effect on the collective. Uh, you know, that's why I try not to channel too much animosity. The president these... is who you is like the symbol of what we tolerate. Right. It's our threshold. It's our threshold. It's so profound. The so yeah, is the Overton window in a way. It is. You're so right. So yeah, the, like the last one. Yeah. There's a huge weave to that. I don't want to derail, but I do want to talk about this quote at the bottom about how bait this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. That is really, I love that quote. Um, because I always say that the going into the wilderness that many of these saviors do, going into the wilderness is just as simple as fasting and not, and not consuming for a prolonged period. And what happens when you do that, it's an opportunity to face demons. You know, these, these processes are laying dormant inside of you. And by fasting, you're actually summoning them, summoning them forth. So that you can hit them head on and process them and have a fresh start when you come back to the, you know, to the good nutritious eats. And I wonder if it's telling you to do that in winter because of Matthew and FOMO hot, if, because you're not as active. So it might be easier to fast when times are slower versus when you're working every day. Excellent. Where you know. would, where you would go with not out because it's cold outside. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Yeah, and again, so even though the tone of Taylor was a little harsh, I have no problem with prayer, fasting, even baptism as a symbolic, you know, concept or other forms of sacrament. I think that there's a lot of power in, honestly, I think like the most powerful way to help shift yourself into the direction you want to go can be, especially if it's more of like a psychological shift, talking about those who are, you know, weak in mind. And if you find yourself in that position, some kind of limiting beliefs about who you are or expectations about life that are 
holding back a full experience of it. A lot of times a cure for that can be to make a different decision about what you want or who you want to be, and then take some kind of symbolic action representing that decision. So it's not inherently bad in any way, but I think where it gets ugly is where it's, oh, because fasting and prayer are associated with this white magic, with this, with kind of like holiness, <laughs> and then it becomes like an identity of, oh, well, uh, I, I have more virtue than you because I'm almost dead. I'm starved almost to death. Dude, you're describing one of the reasons why I like it. I started really thinking about this stuff is because the philosophical argument for it is legit, but the realistic, like it's, it's too idealistic. And I realized, holy shit, by following these methods, they're turning me into a fucking priest. I'm becoming like them. And I was just like, I, I, I can't, I don't want to do this. I don't want, uh, it's too much. It's too much outside of yourself. I know that people are like, well, I meditate and it's all about centering and all, but, but it's like, no, you're sitting around thinking about all these other ramifications and like, you, you know, your relationship with the spiritual aspects of this realm. And you're not fucking doing legit serious work that needs to be done in the physical world and taking massive action. You're too spiritual. You're sitting around, you're meditating, you're fasting, you're doing all this shit. I'm not, there's a time and place for everything, but there's a serious danger of making that a lifestyle. And that's what, that's what made me stop doing that. Cause I realized this is what the fucking priests do. What's next? Cutting your dick off, putting on a dress. Oh, how dare you? So oh, there's the next slide. <laughs> well, everything you just said is super important, actually. You know, it's like all things in balance in moderation. And it's when you go too far to the extreme, you become too much like, honestly, that's what it is, is the, the priest path is a path of feminization. That's why throughout Europe, it's always been like, oh, you have a obviously homosexual son, send him into the seminary. You know, it's, it's, that was like the depository for people that were if men that were effeminized, natural, naturally effeminate even. So it is what it is <laughs> without needing to make judgment calls about it. It's just like <sighs> that, that path of the, the, the path of feminization in terms of yin and yang is the collectivism. It's the, the field versus the point, you know, it's the diffuse versus the focus, I guess is how we put it. And you know, that this goes for, this goes for even indigenous shamanic practices. When you look at their mystical holy men and such, they are teaching or practicing the way of diff <laughs> diffusion. Honestly, that's why it's so interesting that this is the part of cultures that does diffuse between cultures more than anything is this uh, mysticism. They teach the shamanic teachings are about the defocalization, not the focus, focusing, you know, and the problem with that is when you are completely on the side of defocalized, uh, <laughs> you, you become more federal than local in a sense, you know, you become more collective than individual, you become more dependent than strong. And so there's, there's benefits to both the yin and the yang, but by nature's own example, you know, we need the masculine to be more of the masculine and the feminine to be more of the feminine and not get so mixed up between the two, right? Like, <laughs> I think we have plenty of voices in our, our space talking about that. So the next slide though, I couldn't find any um, receipts on this, <laughs> but Taylor claimed, made this claim that is interesting. I did look for receipts on it on, online. Couldn't find anything. That doesn't mean it isn't true. This is going from, <laughs> shut up, Foo Bear, he says with a cat on his lap. I can't help it. This uh, this is, <laughs> this thing just came and got in my lap. It's a good, it's a good <laughs> kitty. There's good a lot person. of superstition coming from Britain where like they do this. They, the, there, There's even a bad side to this um, that is in America, in the South, where they're writing curses and shit 
and like doing weird stuff like that. Like not, not maybe not tying it to the cow, but maybe doing something. So like the idea is it'll make it, you know, infertile or the milk sour. There's all, there is both ways this shit exists. I've heard too many accounts for it to not be something there. Yeah. He yeah. says the name retained by our sacred writings is derived from the belief of their magical influence as a spell or charm of God to drive away diseases. The Irish peasantry still continue to tie the passages of St. John's spell or St. John's God's spell to the horns of cows to make them give us more milk. Nor would any powers of rational argument shake their conviction of the, eff the efficacy of a bit of the word tied around a colt's heels to prevent them from swelling. <laughs> so, you know, you guys get the joke, right? It's a holy cow. <laughs> but on <-tong. laughs> Well played. Well played. Yeah, uh, but they're uh, they're tampering with abundance. You know, they're tampering with the source. You know, these are symbols of fertility. Uh, and yeah, you're right, Dylan. I've heard of that too. You know, the uh, uh, what did they call them? Like the 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 wise ones or. Uh, yeah, but people down south, they, they've been doing it for a very long time and they learn it from their grandma and their grandma used to do it, you know, and then they take it and put little twists on it. And then they find out that their neighbor was doing it. And then they blame things that happened on their property because their neighbor was doing it. And then they start putting hexes on each other and finding, you know, spells on their cow's horn. You're roboting, Gabe, or unless you, unless you oh. might muted or somebody muted you i think he muted right at the end there a little too yeah. quick on the draw it's okay it's okay yeah it's wild what else you got for us oh this next couple of slides this is good stuff all right this is good stuff oh yeah Hi, Ro, motherfucker. Sorry, <laughs> this is the Cairo. the my hero. thing though is it hero like it's hero like it is hero yeah so like sacred hero yeah, so then why do people say Cairo? Like, is that are because they, they don't know it? that the Greek ch what transliterates it from? No, no, Greek the city. Sorry, the city. You know, like Cairo, Egypt. It, I think it's the same. I think it's indisputably because this is all coming from Egypt. I think it's it is like the land of Christ, right? The the yeah. Hero. So uh, that's what I'm saying. Is like, why are the modern people mispronouncing the city? The I Greek. Think the, I think the city is Hero as well. So now we're, we're quoting Dylan in this slide, by the way, <laughs> not a Taylor quote. <laughs> <laughs> the Greek word herotonia, herotonia means hand stretching and is the laying on of hands or invoking the Holy Spirit for blessings during ceremonies such as baptisms. Oh, oh how did you? <laughs> healings ordinations and the like then you know in it oh my god dude get this this just this just flashed into my mind you know what they call it in japan when they lay on hands reiki that's key row backwards whoa brilliant brilliant okay this is so, real shit guys we're not joking around yes <laughs> So to, can we finish the quote? We can finish the go. go yeah, yeah. Game. There's now, so much here. <laughs> Reiki, Kiro, come on. There it is. Done. done. Now consider <laughs> the maker using his hands. Kiro, Cairo, Chiron, chiropractic, etc. The Alpha and Omega of Ambrose was called Chrisma. The staff of Osiris, Kiro, <laughs> was called Cresterion. Cresterion is an oracle or sacrificial victim. Now, I know, I know there's a lot to say about this. I'm going to just do this, the next slide though. Hold up. Next slide because it will finish the point. And this is a Taylor quote. It will become physicians of higher claim. It will become physicians of higher claims to science and rationality when their own forms of prescription shall no longer betray the wish to conceal from the patient the nature of the ingredients to which he is to trust his life, nor bear, as the first mark of the pen upon the paper, the mystical hieroglyphic of Jupiter, 
the talismanic R, under whose influence the prescribed herbs were to be gathered and from whose miraculous agency their operation was to be expected. Okay, so for anyone not familiar with the Greek alphabet, the rho in Greek, the letter R for Greek, looks like a P, an English P. So the he rho is the X with the P, the, the, the rho with the X in the middle of it. This is RX. <laughs> There goes my hero. <laughs> <Watch him laughs> <as> he goes. <laughs> yes, man. Yes. So there is so much going on here. There's so much to unpack. It's it's marvelous. take it away, Gabe. I've said my piece in the book. Jesus Christ. This is <laughs> Dude, there's... It's wild. Like even hearing it reading back to me, it's like, holy shit. Right. I'm gonna make another right. cup of coffee. I'm listening. So, so um, a patient comes into the office of a doctor uh, burdened with symptoms and, you know, uh, sp uh, flaws of the spirit, you know, errors in the program, whatever you want to call it. And they unburden themselves in the presence of this priest by telling them the list of their symptoms. And, uh, and what they receive is nothing more than a little piece of paper with this RX on the corner of it. And then what happens when they receive this little piece of paper? They're not even getting medicine from the, from the priest. They're just getting a piece of paper, a script. And then they literally go in reverse. They go into retrograde when they leave the office and they carry their burdens with them. And they have permission from the priest to be their own messenger. So they literally are taking on the spirit of Mercury themselves. And they leave from the priest, the P, the priest. They go from the priest's office, from the row where the flag is. And where do they go next? The next destination as Mercury? They go to the crossroads. Think about where do you find all your CVS, CVX, uh, Walgreens, they are all at the crossroads. The cross on the row? The, the cross row? The cross row. row. The they cross go row. to the cross row and they make a deal with the devil. That's where they get their fix. And now if you live in the, in the city, you know about the drive-by pickup where you drive by and you meet the medicine man at the intersection. You put your $10 out the window. You better not wave it around too, too quick. Somebody will snatch it out the other window. <laughs> the cross <laughs> row. Never thought about the cross row before. Literally go to the crossroads to get your fix, to get your crossing, RX. Filled. Crossing the roads was what the uh, Phoenician holy sailors were all about. Road meaning sea before yes. it meant street. Yes. You know, and it's it, interesting, uh, you know, I'm learning Greek, right? So the word for street in Greek is a feminine word. Uh, it's uh, odosh, <laughs> odosh. Whoa. So, so, you know, it's a uh, feminine like the sea, the street. or a Yeah, road. it totally sounds kind of <laughs> like ocean, like ocean. Puine dos nikish. Where is Victory Street? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm learning some Greek. I can nice. say the most important phrase. Uh, I want to eat now. <laughs> nice. <laughs> anyway. Nice party. So, so just as, just this last week, I'm uh, studying the uh, dialogues of Cratylus, which we're told predates a lot of things. We're told that this is, you know, 400, 500 BC, and maybe is sourced from even earlier. We're told. And in that dialogue, Socrates is talking about the, uh, the nature of words. He's saying, are the sounds the essence of the subject, or is, are the sounds just conventions? Is that just what people make it out to be all about? And it's a very fascinating dialogue. And he, he wavers into three different camps over the course of, uh, I was listening to it uh, on audio. So it was two and a half hours playing it at double speed. It was like an hour and a half still. It was a long run. But in that, I find so many little jewels buried in this huge diatribe, these long drawn out di uh, dialogues. And one of them was where Socrates says that the word 
hero comes from eros that eros as in love it was was the first uh the first divine essence born it's like the first uh, prerogative the first priority of the gods when they it's made the everything. savior he's the, the savior being. because erotic love is what brings mom and dad together and perpetuates the generation of you know yep. future Existence. And it was on the inscription at Larissa with Apollo, the epithet of Apollo, the first two letters of Tetragrammaton, Yod Hey yeah. or Iota Eta or Jesus, and Chris, Christ, Christos. Nice. Yes. All the same. Guys, I think we might have overdid the gravy today, even by our standards. It's pretty <laughs> fucking strong. We're not I, was even like, done. I was like listening to you guys of like with the 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 he roads or whatever. And you mentioned Mercury. dude, the rosy cross, Brian Rose pointed yeah. out like the rosy cross, the key row terminalia terminus, the end of the year. Yeah, man. Yeah. Gotta say, also shout out Rachel and Logan for doing double duty. Both of them have super chatted twice in this stream. I don't know what everyone else's excuses, but you know, <laughs> I love some support. Thanks you guys. You guys yeah, are Rachel's awesome. awesome. Nice. Thank you to everybody she else. is. And she is. So is Logan. And so Braden super chatted earlier. You guys are great. Logan, I, I thought Logan was somebody else that we don't like anymore. <laughs> no, I Logan's the like, man. I was like, hey, you got you got somebody is uh be careful of that guy. I think he does it. <laughs> I totally confused him with somebody else, but I swear I've seen that name before. I just don't know where I've seen it. No, in Logan my live chats, good. he's been around, man. No, yeah, man. I, I'm telling you, I feel like he's has he been on uh like Crow or some other podcast? No, no, I he's watch. He's just a, a Young man raising oh. chickens and taking telescopic pictures of the, <laughs> the luminaries. So I want to I want to finish off the Socrates weave, oh, pointing yeah, at the hero at being the source of Eros, being the hero, and he says that only he, people born as heroes are made for for kingship, have the divine right of kings, and. And it sounds just uh, strictly literal or superstitious, but I want to kind of bring in the cosmological part of it. I think that different kingdoms, different cultures in different places, that they had certain celestial alignments that were the target for the, for the perfect golden child chosen one. And so let's say in Rome, the perfect baby would line up with Orion's belt pointing down at the birth, rebirthing of the sun. And so, therefore, the perfect child, the perfect king or leader or hero of man would be born on that day, which means that the mama's got to have the wisdom to get pregnant on the right month so that nine months later, the baby comes out with the birthright of kings. So I think there's something about the uh, targeting. You're literally like taking their aim nine months ahead and you're shooting for a divine baby to land in December. In other places, we might be born in the on tenth Rockman. month. Thank you, buddy. Thanks for the oh, help. yeah. Some of them are Let's born in 10 months. months. Yeah, yeah, totally. Because they're extra special. For those that don't know, that's that's like sun god symbolism. Menci yeah, decimo. Tenth nice. month. Yeah. Oh, man. Okay. I'm going to push this forward. We only had a few more slides. Then we can really cut loose into wild... Have Gravy some people on. Have, have some of you uh, people out there call in. Doesn't doesn't he have a? Oh yeah, they can send us voicemails on the Telegram line. Oh, we got time for that. We should be through the slides Maybe. pretty quick. Uh, a few more, but they are they're good ones. All right. So <laughs> Taylor claims the Therapeutae of Egypt, from whom are descended the vagrant hordes of Jews and Gypsies had well found by what arts mankind were to be cajoled. They boasted their acquaintance with the sensitive herbs of all countries. So since, you know, we brought up a certain group of people. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> is, the, is the library of Alexandria burning? Is it the first Holocaust? Eh? <laughs> eh? Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it would be, I honestly wonder, like, did the, uh, because I think that there was some, eventually some dissension between the Rome version of Christianity and then uh, what was going on, like maybe those first 300 years before 
the church really kicked off with their Nicene creeds. Maybe there is some like gang battle going on. It's important to know that though, the, the Therapeuti, Essenes, they are Jewish Buddhists. It's not an ethnicity. None of these things are an ethnicity. They're just a cult chair. And so like when you look at the very word Jew, it comes from tetragrammaton. You'll have to excuse uh, my writing because I'm, I'm not even like on something legit. But if you were to look at that tetragrammaton, yod hey vav hey, it literally can be translated as J-E-W-E, Jew, right? So that's where it comes or from. Or I-U-E. Yeah. That's why in in, uh, in Greek, you'll see the root is you, Yudai. So it's all the same. It's all pertaining to God. And that is all going to be I, uh, Apollo, all of the sun gods, right? Okay, uh, we figured it out with Logan. It. You banned him from Instagram. Oh, did I? <laughs> he had a moment. He he said he had a Dunning Kruger Kruger gamma moment. He I, I have ton, <laughs> I I have banned like probably upwards of ten thousand to twenty thousand people. <laughs> That's so, like tw like twenty percent twenty I times. Literally, your actual I I've, I've banned Ra I like Rachel Sparks and I banned her. If I tell you not to do something and you sass me, I'm going to just ban you because that's my social. It doesn't mean I dislike you. Just I curate my social media. I don't want to log in and get people drama. So it's like I tell people, it's like, hey. I do that with YouTube really heavily. Like, yeah, you know, because I banned someone earlier and they didn't even do anything fully wrong yet. I just didn't like the vibe and my attention kept getting drawn to it. Like thinking any second there's going to be a comment that I don't like. So I just ban them. It is what it is. You know, it's our house. Uh, bring good energy and be cool. And I'm not sorry, but don't take anything. Per if I ban somebody, don't take it personally. I don't remember you. I don't know who I banned. I could not care less. It's just numbers. It's just good me. policy to be overly, yeah. uh, overly using the ban hammer. It's, I would, it's better to ban more than you need to than not enough in terms of... <laughs> having a good community <laughs> uh cultivating a good community same here though if i you know if you're watching and you can't chat because you got banned and you're still watching wow thank you for that you know there's other ways to connect with the community there's telegram and stuff and if you're cool there i won't know that i banned you in the other place so anyway um i think that the holocaust of the library of alexandria was possibly the invoking of some victim status i don't know just saying, I think that maybe that's like, uh, it's just possible. Just, it's just a mm -hmm. thought experiment, but talking about the, the gypsy Jewish Buddhist situation here, most important thing about that we still see as a part of, you know, like masonry today, for example, although it's kind of gotten pretty loosey goosey with masonry, but in general, that was the idea behind it. No principle was held more sacred than that of the necessity of keeping the sacred writings from the knowledge of the people. Well, wasn't it Jesus that says in the New Testament, cast ye not pearls before swine? It's the same idea. You know, well, there guys, are, you're right. We could do an entire I regret it. Sometimes we could I just, think we are someday we could pearls. just go through the New Testament and like the red letter Masonic Bible, for example, and just find quotes, examples like of the world. Or uh, in the world, but not of it, you know, these are like the various quotes and examples that will demonstrate the Essenian nature of the entire situation. The monks being of the, the monk class they're in the world, but not of it. I think that perfectly describes the monastic system. But to finish the Taylor quote, this is important. The change of names and places and the mixing up of various sketches of the Egyptian, Phoenician, Greek and Roman mythology would constitute a sufficient disguise to evade the languid curiosity of infant skepticism, a knowledge within the acquisition of only a few and which the strongest possible interest bound that few to hold inviolate would soon pass entirely from the records of human memory. So <laughs> this is where the dupers duped themselves, basically, that 
take it away. Talk, talk about that, Dylan. Um, Do you think at any point, like any of the like priests were like, guys, are you sure we're supposed to be wearing dresses and not having sex with women? Oh yeah, yeah. This is this is exactly what you're supposed to be doing. And you know, it's like at some point, it's almost like there. There's funny accounts of them like uh, they blame when they would get in fights with each other they would blame women because they were like well if we weren't around these women and they weren't tempting us we wouldn't be getting all worked up so we need to abstain from women and then you know and eat only like herbs and whatever else and that'll like mellow us out and shit like a lot of funny thing is most of the magic and even in my opinion the astronomy probably started with women anyway so it's like this weird jealousy of the feminine in a strange mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. Yeah. I've been thinking a lot about the idea of, uh, you know, there's a, some sort of economic collapse on the horizon, you know, this, whatever the reset is supposed to be. And isn't it strangely convenient for some and inconvenient for others that, I'm predicting a female president, maybe not this time, but the next time when it's inevitable that somebody else comes in. I'm thinking it's going to be uh, Tulsi Gabbard. And wouldn't it be something for her to inherit an economic collapse? I don't think so, I, I, they can't resist the 9-11 symbolism of Donald Trump being the 45th and then the 47th president. I, I don't I, think I, they can resist it. If they if they can, I told Owen this, I was like, if they can resist this. They have reached a new level of discipline that we now need to be aware of. That's a great point. It would be a nine and an eleven. You're absolutely right. And and uh, and Biden he is like would, totally in on nine eleven, right? You know? So and it's Bi like perfect. And Biden would be the yod. He's the missing ten, the hidden hand. The ten is missing from the nine and the eleven. That's a hidden hand encode right there. That's a have a nice day, hidden hand. So. Uh, but I'm thinking Tulsi eventually. No, I'm saying, you could be right. I'm just saying yeah. if they if they resist this this time, yeah, we must concede that they have reached a new level of discipline. Yeah, they are they are able to do stuff. They are able to like it's like it's like a, a priest being able to resist the beautiful woman, right? Yeah, they, I think well, that's I, a I great that's a great point. I don't I don't want to give up Tulsi on number forty seven because uh it, because forty seven is the number of silver. And she's got the silver streak in her hair. She's silver-eyed Athena. And it's uh, there's so many things silver pointing at her. She's got the circumscripta. But I think you're right, Dylan. That would be sophisticated as a motherfucker for, for all the generations to come to be like, he was 9 and 11 when you reduce it. You're so right. Uh, but but uh, my point is, it's almost tragic that it would be the first presidentess and she would inherit the economic collapse such that they could look back forever and say, see, we put a woman in the sea and look what happened. You know, when in fact she's inheriting the inevitability of generations. I don't think before. it's going to happen this fast because I think um, we are, most of us are still in a mindset that the monetary system is an older system that doesn't really exist anymore. And now when they create bank reserves, None of that shit's actually going into the hands of the people and creating money velocity. So we don't really have to worry about them creating all this and it creating hyperinflation or anything because it's all being kept in the system and they're just swapping it out. I think what we have to worry about is them getting rid of cash and going into not crypto, not like programmable currency, but just a centralized. See how like all these banks are failing and then JP Morgan's buying them up and the government's basically like, yeah, we'll prop you up via the American people. Essentially, you can't fail. Well, I think what we're going to see is like this creep towards a one world ledger system with yep. the bank reserves. And then our social credits tied into that. Like, that's, I think, where this is going. I don't think we have to worry about collapse like that. I just think people are too productive now. Mm -hmm. And I think somebody's got to be smart enough to realize, you know, if we collapse, it's going to be like, releasing the american people into entrepreneurial spirit which is what they're good at anyway don't do that do not right. allow that to happen because once that happens the american people are very industrious you know yep. people are hustlers here all over the yep. world people come here and they're hustlers or uh, they're they're ingenious you know they, they come yeah. up with a lot of new systems and business ideas so 
I don't think we have to worry about collapse. I think we have to worry about, I don't think we have to worry about the dollar losing reserve status either because there's no, eventually, yeah, but in the short term, there's nothing better to go into. And though our government is trash and corrupt as all fucking hell, the people of America are still good. And so when you're around the world and you have a choice to do business with some, with the Chinese or the American, you're probably going to choose the American because we have a longer history of paying people, right? Think of all the people you take down the American the United States, you're going to have tons of other countries that get funding that rely on us for food. They're going to get taken down. So there's just no incentive. And I think yeah. a lot of people have realized that, you know, the American people are they, does, is the West absolutely disgusting? Yes. Is everybody in the West absolutely disgusting? No, it's just a programming. It's a social engineering thing that can be corrected. I think a lot of people, if they're not emotional, can see that, yeah, Western culture is declining, but it can change real quick as fast as it declined. We just got to stop promoting cutting off dicks and, you know, rebus, weird shit, occult stuff, you know, just just stop with that. And, you know, everything will correct itself. Get rid of birth control. Get rid of all the fucking killing babies. Right. Can't have this population mm -hmm. collapse. Yeah. A lot of people you know, don't want to look into that, but it's really simple. It's really fucking simple. I got, I got yeah, a fun anagram. Support life. Support life and yeah. we win. That's yeah. right. Yeah, man. A uh, fun anagram from America. Chimera. Chimera. You got it. It's over my, you got to like, you know, I'm not as smart as you think when it comes to some of the shit you go into. Chimera, America Chimera. Yeah. It's America is, is a Chimera. And we are the great American experiment. You know, we're the we're some kind of crazy mixing pot of potentiality, and I think we're going to rise to the top, Phoenix style, baby. He Mara, Mara, <laughs> right? Yeah, uh, guys, I Mara. want the team in the chat to like really think about the what, where else the hero is coming from. I'm super into that weave. <laughs> Other yeah, that than was, the R, that the was, prescription, uh, the Rx. Really but dude, the I can't believe I just now realized it's Reiki. Kiro is that's Reiki. Oh, that's what I want. you just reminded me because a lot of people don't realize. I guess that. why I didn't realize it is because I never had the context of all those other words, keratonia, kerotonia. That's how you say it. Mm -hmm. You know, hand, laying on of hands, and the other, krisma, krestirion. Oracle sacrificial victim didn't have that context till Terminalia. So thanks for that. It is the hero is Reiki. So when you look at Hebrew, it doesn't keep to its own rules whatsoever at all. That's one of the, the problems with it. So if you were to look at like the etymology of uh, Hebrew, it's uh, it literally looks like the, the, it looks like Obri. So you would have the uh, iron, which is like an O just that you just have to deal with that kind of more like a Phoenician in the, but anyways, it would, it would yeah. look like it would have those little fucking flares at the, at the top, you know, those little silly ass, like whatever. Uh -huh. uh, but that is an, O. but they transliterate it as Ibri. So why are they using an O and turning it into an I? Well, if you look at the interchangeability of letters, that he, that O, that I is also or the O is also an I, and the E is also an O. All you have to do is look at all the interchangeability of English words of show, or of O, like E and O, like the word show in a, a couple hundred years ago was S-H-E-W, right? Show right. it, you know, and that's like, when you say like the E-T-H, well, the T and D interchange, that's why we say past tense, ed like i showed him this but it's that's what it means in the old world it, i show it you know what like, yes. so you see that interchangeability so just to back chance up on the because someone might not realize how that is and that k is also interchangeable with ch so that cho becomes key also one of our listeners i don't know if he's in the chat tonight but he comes on a lot uh josh He's got an article where he has compiled all the similarities fr from Japan's priesthood to the Hebrew rituals. And man, like the square hat is enough, but <laughs> there's tons there. So I am also now realizing 
the key row, the phonetics of that is kind of in, encapsulated in kurios, Lord, the Greek word for Lord. And also, I don't know if it's if I'm pronouncing them wrong or not, but I'm pretty sure a homonym for kurios, aka Lord, is kurios, which is subjective time versus chronos, measured time, subjective time. So you have the idea of time and the Lord and the hero and, and healing all kind of, you know, <laughs> my lovely wife, Jennifer, she says all the time, time is the healer, the, the greatest healer, you know? So there's definitely a lot there. I, I feel like we could get lost in that weave forever. That's cool. And all those that names, cool. if you strip away... They, they have that phonetic. Doesn't matter whether it's Kairos, Ceres, Ceres, Keres, right? It's that Christ, it has that encode and there's no getting around that. Mm. It's a crusty weave right there. Crunchy. <laughs> okay, so we just got a couple of slides left. We're, we're so close to the end and then we can hang out proper. Um, yeah, it's, get it it's so it. good. But I just want to make the, you know, the last little two slides happen so we can consider oh it fell off okay screen share fell off one second but i think so these we can are very appropriate pauses to explain these things because you got to remember definitely there's people that are going to see this that have no freaking clue what we're talking about because we assume that they know what we know and you got to slow it down because sometimes you know like gabe when he said chimera i had no idea what he was talking about but then once you explain i'm like oh yeah gotcha you know yeah man uh I definitely uh, tread lightly in the realm of anagrams, folks. It is fascinating, but once you start, I mean, I read stuff, and there are certain words that uh, that are anagram rich, uh, and I I find myself like almost derailing an entire reading session when I'm like find a word like uh, scripture is persecute. You know, I find these fascinating anagrams all throughout our language. And uh, yeah, and then they come up later and I'm just like, here it is again. Persecute scripture. The last phrase in the Holy Bible is if you fuck with this book, you're going to get persecuted in plagues, you know, and that's and that's a protection against uh, plagiarism uh, or, you know, Isn't it funny how the only unpardonable sin is to blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Right. Say whatever the hell you want about Jesus. Yes. Don't you dare blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Don't mess with the HG. <laughs> it's so funny. Oh my gosh. And uh, blasphemy includes attributing the works of the Holy Spirit to the devil, which is what, the, you know, if there is a divine inspiration behind the system to go and accuse all of the different elements of diffusion in other cultures and like the way that Christian themes or, you know, this system existed before Christianity. And they're like, you know, some of the church fathers will say that's because God was paving the way for us to understand Christianity when it comes. And then others will say, no, the devil came and imitated what Jesus was going to do and put it in the mythologies of these other cultures before Jesus came to trick everybody. Well, the ones that are doing the second thing, they're, in my opinion, they're breaking the unpardonable sin right there, blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. <laughs> That's so funny. So, okay, here we go. Talking about, you know, the, okay, a long continued habit of imposing upon others would in time subdue the minds of the imposters themselves and cause them to become at length the dupes of their own deception, to forget the temerity in which their first assertions had originated to catch the infection of the prevailing credulity and to believe their own lie. The cracker is literally flesh. <laughs> the wine is literally blood. You know, the, totally missing can we, that, can we that the whole though? offering of bread and wine is a Buddhist thing because they didn't want to offer animal sacrifices because they were in this sort of ascetic veganism vibe. When do you harvest the grains? Virgo, right? End of summer. That is the bread. That's all that is made from the, the wrath of God who imbues his spirit, the sun, and imbues the spirit of the water of the grape, which is then pressed, right? And then turned into wine. 
and it is vinegary. If anyone's ever made wine, if it doesn't ferment the right way, it tastes like vinegar. I used to have to do this with my grandfather all the time. He'd send me in the cellar to get a bottle and I'd have to be the one to taste it. And half of them are fucking vinegar. <laughs> and so the body is not a vampire ritual that the actual Christians of modern day really accept that. They really believe they're eating the blood and flesh in a mock sacrifice uh, of uh, the son of God. They don't realize it's the S-U-N. It's the, it's the grain that is created from the sun, the wheat, right? And it is the blood, which is the blood of Christ, the blood of good, the wine. That's why they called wine, certain uh, the good wine in Italy, the tears of Christ. It's not a vampire ritual, a cannibal ritual. It's literally the fruit of the sun, grain and wine, wheat and wine, bread and wine, right? Without, what, uh, what's that old Latin saying? Without love, it's uh, without bread and wine, love grows cold. So it's like without Ceres and Bacchus, uh, Venus grows, is frigi I forget the Latin phrase, but love grows cold. So that's part of love right? Love, Cupid, Eros, Christ. All of this is good symbolism. The Paulite, Jortonian men in dresses have turned it into a satanic, cannibalistic vampire ritual. And they're doing that because they are unlearned, ignorant, uninitiated fools that are part of a system uh, that they have no friggin' clue where it comes from. And it's because they're ignorant of the stuff that you guys take so seriously and that I take seriously, which is the study of the original uh, mysteries and learning what it encodes. That is the priestcraft. And if you don't know this ancient universal system, you're going to end up wearing a dress and doing mock cannibalistic rituals, if not actual cannibalistic rituals. That's why it's important. But as it is, that's not a bad ritual the communion or whatever you want to call it, you know, the uh, Eucharist. You. That's Christ, a really good uh, breakdown, the, dude. The good Christ, right? The good grace, Caris. Caris. Grace. The good grace. Eucharist. All right. So it doesn't look like Gabe's going to jump in on that. Dylan, good stuff. I'm um, yeah, going to finish the last slide here. I think this is important. I mean, I only did one slide on this, but you could do a lot of slides on times in the Bible where this type of thing is demonstrated, right? Proto-communism. So <laughs> this is what I was trying to weave all together, that the medical establishment, that mafia, communism, the priest's craft, and man, what else? All kinds of things, a uh, transgender agenda, all kinds of things that are plaguing modern society have their origins from this College of Alexandria, these therapeutic. Again, not to say every single one of them was bad or every ounce of philosophy was bad, but that this is where it came from. <laughs> Even as it is related in the accredited Acts of the Apostles, that all who were known of the Apostles or who had imbibed their doctrine were wont to sell their possessions and substance and divided them among all, according as any one had need so that there was not one among them in want. For whoever were owners of estates or houses, as the word says, sold them and brought the pieces, prices of the things sold and laid them at the apostles' feet that it might be divided to each as everyone had need. Now, I don't have any problem with the, I, the principle of this. You know, if you and a group of people who are on the same spiritual path or they're your family or like you want to pool resources with people that you trust and care about. Great. But it's when you take this and expand it into the collective and force it upon people that it becomes like the evilest shit ever, as we have seen over and over again in every example of communism attempting to take root in some nation. So, you know, I'm not over here. Like be greedy. Don't be, don't share. <laughs> or whatever. It's not that, but you know, go back to that vibrant we did on, on Ayn Rand and really dig into some of the things that we got into it regarding the, uh, the toxic toxicity of public altruism of yeah. this badge, wearing this badge of honor of like, you know, I'm self, it's the same as asceticism. 
I'm the most self-sacrificing for the group. I'm the most like I killed my individuality for the collective more than anybody. I have the highest victim currency of all. It's all in the same, it's all in the same wheelhouse, right? And what you're talking about is more the entitlement to some the fruits of somebody's labor. It's one thing if somebody has produced overabundance or abundance, I should say, and they just want to share it with you. That's totally different. It's but great. It's like, yeah, yeah it's community, great. that's what communities are for. Yeah, but it's the what where this is really going is the custodianship and the tithing, and we're gonna own every. It goes straight to the fucking papal bulls, where it's like, yeah, we own everything, including your soul, motherfucker. Pay that tithe or else, you know. And that's where it, that's it. It's always dressing this shit up. And I've got when you're done with this, I've got a quote related just to this very thing that you've narrated in one of our books that I also want to read that I actually pulled up while you were doing this. So when, when you're done with this, let me know. I'm yeah, done I with the slides. I've just got a, I've got a couple of uh, listener call-ins. Okay. Well, let, well, let's do, don't yeah. distract. Let's. So there's a uh, Alvin Boyd. Coo oh, Gabe, did you want to jump in real quick? Cause there, I have something to say about communism and Christianity. Yeah. <laughs> I, just, I just want to like coin a term on the fly here. Like, you know, weaponized inclusiveness. You know, uh, Dude, you're a poet, man. That's brilliant. You should hear yeah, his man. actual poetry. He's literally a poet. <laughs> He's like a bard. Good. Yeah. Yeah, man. Nothing, nothing triggers me more nowadays than hearing the, I, the phrase, you know, we're all in this together. Fucking initiate yourself, motherfucker. 100% <laughs> individual right here. <laughs> Well, because you know how hard you had to work. And it's one thing to help somebody who is helping themselves and like is going to do the work. It's like that saying, catch a man, a fish, you feed him for a day, you teach him how to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. It's kind of like that. But I wanted to go in this quote before we get off of this communism Christianity, because it's real important. And if you want to hear this, I'll type it into the chat when I'm done uh, and you can buy it. It's, it's Chance narrated this book. It's called God's Acre for Winds of the Soul. And I'm citing Alvin Boyd Kuhn. And he wrote, lying immediately under the eye then of anyone who will be observant are seen to be two predominant forces of personal, or sorry, personnel, purpose and policy embodied in the activity. Okay, so that's what he's saying. Purpose and policy, right? Two, the two predominant forces of personnel embodied in the activities of two strong and intensely vigorous groups of partisans. Both are distinctly bent upon the purpose of dominating the entire world. As quite and understandably, any group harboring a plot aiming at world control would not dare proclaim or let slip its real intent to common knowledge. The first strategy of such a predatory motivation is to disguise its real drive under the name, style, and semblance of a high-sounding and broadly generalized romantic ideality or utopian humanitarianism, as Gabe said, weaponized inclusiveness, right? Every such and bold scheme, uh, sorry, every, yeah, every such a bold scheme will show itself masquerading behind a cloak or front of this sort. This stratagem has been openly proclaimed by a publicist of one of the two parties as the routine formula of successful deception to attain fixed goals. It is even more patient, or sorry, it is even more patent if unattested in the constant moves and ruses of the other of the two parties. The two parties he was writing about in that were communism and Christianity, which you now know are one and the same. And Christianity ceased to exist in its Hellenic capacity after the third century. There is and has only been the church. And, um, what I wanted to, uh, I'll, I'll post it in the chat now, but that's what I wanted to, to show people is like what you see, what we were talking about with the banking system earlier, with the centralization of the ledger system is what they fucking did in your uh, Russia from the 1920s to the 1990s. That's exactly what they're doing now, guys. We better wake up. And I mean, like, not wake up from a slumber, but like become aware of what the hell is going on. Because once they get rid of our cash, that's the music stopping. And all you have is what you've accrued outside of that system. 
And the way things are looking, I don't think it's, it's going to be, you're going to be hard pressed to convince me we will still have cash in five years because of the way the banks are behaving right now when you try to get your money. So just be mindful of that because it's hard to get your money right now. Go try taking out 10 grand and see the hoops that they make you jump through. Yeah, yeah. at best, you'll be waiting hours. I yield back. I just wanted to include that. Nice, man. Nice. Uh, so one thing that was on my mind a little bit earlier when we were talking about the Romas and the gypsies and this, you know, this, the idea of uh, a migrant culture. Um, uh, right now, you know, the for, 42, whatever, whatever 42 just opened the, opened the gates. And now there's all, all kinds of influx of, you know, whatever they're calling it, whatever's politically okay to not get kicked off of YouTube to call the people <laughs> that are come flooding in. Uh, I just find it quite fascinating. Um, there's actually legislation out there uh, that I was floating a few months ago where you can't even talk about the term replacement theory, which is like they're legislating against talking about replacement theory, which I didn't even know that was a thing. I had to go look up what that is. And now I got to tiptoe through the tulips when I talk about the topic. Um, but it, it's, it's fascinating because it ha it's happened before uh, culturally, it, uh, you know, this, infusion of a cheaper working class uh you know to demoralize the uh the established paradigms but also i want to point out last week there was a headline about pot ash that pot ash production which is generally used in uh fertilizer that it's uh it, there was a some kind of collapse at the distribution and it's it's, it's going to be going for a premium for the next for a very long time because of this well there's something else in there between the lines there, in, in the same, if you're reading a newspaper, remember newspapers? If you were reading a newspaper, on one page you'd be seeing, uh, you know, gypsies, romas, on the move, this migrant body of people. And then also on another page you would see an article on potash. And that just kind of flipped my, uh, tickled my fancy because potash has been used in spycraft in the olden days so that uh, you can convert white, pale, fair skin into dark skin for a prolonged period. And uh, people who wanted to hide out or integrate into a migrant uh, culture, like the gypsies, they would put pot ash on so that they became darker skinned and they would not fit their description. And that's actually legitimate spy craft history. So to see migrants on the move and pot ash in the same headlines at the same time, uh, it made me think that the spies are like signaling to those who are in the know. Uh, just a just an interesting little tidbit. And you brought up replacement theory. We're on the list now just for saying that phrase. But I, it's okay if I say it was on legislation. I don't know. It mean, well, it means that you, we're all white. We're all white. We're probably we, we don't even get dude. I, look at this red skin, son. Look at this red skin. <laughs> sun kissed. Sun kissed over here. That's the and we are, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I do uh, look red, you guys. I, I you can't see it because I'm not next to anybody. But if you see me next to somebody, you'd be like, dude, that guy's like literally a native. I look really red. I was in the <laughs> Yeah, sun you got today. some sun. Yeah, I did my Greek lessons while sunbathing in the nude. Yeah, buddy. It was cool. Sun, <laughs> sun in days. your balls. Yeah, you got to do it on the good days. All right, you guys want to hear from Braden? Braden yeah, man. The man. All right, let's do what he had to say to us from about 20 minutes ago. All right, hear me out. As a living member of Clan Moses, I feel like I just leveled the F up. His last name is Moses. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. We got 10 new chickens last weekend, and I have them separated down in the tractor right now. And I went outside. Uh, my wife's out of town, and I have a, my big freaking awesome flashlight. And I have my dope walking staff. And I'm going around to go close the chicken tractor, and all I see as I round the corner with my flashlight is... A coiling tail in the head, and most of the body is already in the chicken tractor. And I rush over there, and I'm, I'm, what are you doing? 
stab, stab, not, not stabbing, but I'm kind of starting to wrestle with this guy. I'm trying to scoop him with my staff as I hold my flashlight in the other hand. And I eventually get him kind of pinned around here and he works his way out. And I finish this by holding and hoisting him up with my staff as a Moses. And I tossed his ass over the fence. <laughs> oh, great show tonight. I missed a little bit. Much love, guys. Was it brazen? What a brilliant story. Wow. Great share. Great share, brother. That is so I cool. Get, I had an encounter with a snake uh, earlier this week with my family. Prevented them from killing it. <laughs> it's in their yard. It's in a nice snake hole right in the sidewalk up to my parents' house. Yeah. You know, that's the thing is we didn't even touch on the symbolism of the rod of Asclepius, you know, and how, but I feel like that's pretty I don't even uh, think well we known. touched on Asclepius, but that's where, you know, that's where Jesus comes from. Isn't Asclepius said by Philo to be, uh, Philo the Jew, I mean, of the Therapeute, to have been the founder of the Therapeute? Uh, I think so. Yeah. That's their, or it's at the very least, it's like their patron deity, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and he's got so many similarities to Pyth Pythagoras and Jesus. In term he's an astrotheological character, no doubt. Yeah, and I'm still tripping over the weave on by O-Field encoding the two Ophi, the double serpent, by Ophi, the biofield. That's a trip and a half that it snuck its way in the modern day terminology still. Yeah, that's good. And uh, that's good weave. Also, uh, the reason the the devil is sometimes depicted as a monkey is because it's that that root oaf is also ape, in addition to a serpent. Mm. Cough. Cough. Yeah. <laughs> you're coughing. <laughs> oh, you're coughing, and it puts you in the coffin. Hey. <laughs> You drink too much caffeine. Oh, somebody's coughing in my coffin. <laughs> okay, let's let's see what Mick has for us. He's got about 30 seconds of a video clip he sent us. I'm sure it's interesting. This is just a strange synchronicity. I was laying on my bed listening to the show, and there's this pamphlet right laying right on top of the stack. And also their little slogan underneath the title there, Vibrant Health, where science meet and nature meet. Isn't that kind of what you guys are doing? Like meeting science with nature? <laughs> That's funny. The video for some reason was mirrored. But yeah, this is vibrant science and nature. <laughs> well, science, literally the first step of the scientific method is to observe a natural phenomenon. Right. No natural phenomenon, you're not doing science. doesn't invalidate what you're doing. It just means you're not doing science. And people need to remember that when they use that word. All right, Dylan, what's this? What is this? Oh, shit. Zoom in on that, son. Okay, what are we looking at? Okay, and am I, do I need to get anything. another pair of pants ready? Yes. Yes and yes. <laughs> So going back to what I was talking, you know how like, so for those who've been paying attention to my sub stack, I've continued what I finished here and I've been going into more of the Phoenicians and the ancient Italian route. Exactly. Uh, Buddha yoga. That's exactly it. It's not science. You're hundred percent correct. Um, so one of the things, uh, and I already mentioned this, right? But like, this should be a mic drop because they try to tell everybody that Etruscans and their language and shit comes from Greek, but Greek is Indo-European. Etruscan is not. Phoenician, and Etruscan is Phoenician, right? And going back to what Betham said, the first great colony of the Phoenicians was Italy. The Etruscans are actually native. They're indigenous to Italy. Yes, they have a, a, a love for Orientalism, but it's no different than anybody else traveling around the world and bringing back all these exotic type of things and really gravitating to one type of art, right? Um, so when you look at this culture, 
and they're being employed by Phoenicians and all this other stuff. Where we've talked about the accounts of Konun, uh, or is it Konun? I always forget. I have to. It always when I look at the Greek, depending on what's accent accented, is determines how you pronounce it. I think it's Konun. Could be wrong, but he was a Greek general, and he said that the Phoenicians once possessed the empire of Asia, and they made Egyptian Thebes their capital. And Egyptian Thebes is what we call Luxor. And that, if you look at that, it's really far down the, the Nile, um, almost to the cataracts, right? I think you go to uh, Aswan, and then you get a little bit past that, and you get to the cataracts where it's impassable. But according to a lot of people, and I can't verify this, right, but just through their research and accounts, they, serious historians, they said that the coastlines are a lot different back then. Um, certain rivers in Italy were once navigable, navigable with water uh, for, by by boats that aren't anymore. Now they're shallow and just like dried up rivers and whatnot. But what you're looking at, if it's authentic, do you recognize any of those letters? You're literally looking at. Definitely do. I see an M. Yeah. I see an R. C yeah. P T N. You're looking at attrition like a form of attrition and this was found wrapping uh, the mummy was wrapped in these i'm not going to tell you is where you can go find it on your own but for those of you who are interested in <laughs> stay tuned to my sub stack because it'll eventually come out that's what i'm working on right now and so they're finding this in places where you would think they wouldn't find this and um, this is what I think they're covering up, this ancient universal empire. I think that's why they, re that's the real, I, I understand they might be concerned about destroying artifacts in China. And that's why they're not excavating the pyramids yet. But I also suspect that uh, there's something else there that they're worried about seeing like what it may reveal. Just like in South America, they don't let you ex excavate all those sites in Peru and all that stuff in Bolivia. Uh, they're worried that the findings are going to undo what, you know, the cultural government, if you will, has taught people about their past. And once you see, uh, like, you see, like, these red-haired skulls and shit and whatever else, you know, you see these certain Caucasian types of things uh uh, remains in certain places that you wouldn't expect them to be. I think what we're looking at, the diffusion between the Americas is like a result of the Egyptian. But what I'm what I'm trying to piece together is it looks like it the the, the Phoenicians were who the Egyptians probably hired to take them to and fro. And one of the reasons we don't see remains from the Phoenicians as much as we would like other than like the little, the cultural diffusion is because back, especially with the Egyptians, they had a serious superstition about wanting to be buried in their homeland and not going on. And so like when you're being hired by a Pharaoh or a King or whatever, you were doing the bidding for that sovereign. And then you were coming back for that sovereign. You weren't just going and caught. Now, some, some places, Right. They just sent people off to like, you're going to go find land and fucking colonize. And there's some expeditions where people do that. But in terms of this specific system, they weren't doing that because they were on behalf of a sovereign. And so that's why they return. And that's why there's not a whole lot of like colonizing happening by these navigation guilds. So I just want to give you that teaser. Yeah, I, I found the mummy you're talking about here <laughs> and it's crazy just looking at what is said about Etruria and, you know, the claims by the mainstream that are so obviously demolished in like the Holy Sailors book, especially that, which by the way, we should remind everyone as we're moving towards a wrap up that the Holy Sailors is now available as an audio book. And in that book, you will see the connection between the Phoenician slash Etruscan peoples and Ireland and Great Britain. You will see how the gods of the Etrurian people were more likely the origin of the Greek gods rather than the Greek gods being brought to them.
Can you play them? The mainstream says that the Greek gods are, uh, the, their trade with Greece is what brought them Greek gods. But no, man, I think that when you look at the the system, it's the the older version is the Etrurian version. It seems like to me. What were you asking, Dylan? It's the, it's the Phoenicians. Well, I was gonna say like maybe in closing you could play that or do it now, whatever. Play the play the sample, so people. Oh, can, that's a great you, idea. You can pull it up, and you can that's play it. People can hear you. Gabe and I can use the potty or whatever, and then uh, you know whatever else we close out. Sounds good, especially yeah, but... the bathroom part. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me find it. I'm on my new computer, but I have everything better organized than ever and before. One of the things that's really cool about the Holy Sailors, in my opinion, is it's one of the first of the spirit. It's like one of the only spirit world books where you don't necessarily need the knowledge It'll, of the other books. It'll help you, but you can access it as just somebody who's not interested in the occult because the whole point of it was I had to do this like almost like a digression to show people that the Phoenicians are not Afro-Asiatic. Their language is not Indo-European. It's not from the East. If anything, it's from the Egypt, just like that person in the chat that you muted was saying like, yeah, Paleo Hebrew, it has the same alphabet, but that doesn't mean they spoke the language. It is a lingua franca. They had to develop letters. People don't seem to understand this. If you were to just look at like the Chinese system, the Egyptian system, that is not conducive to trade. The development of the letters is what enabled them to create this lingua franca amongst each other and do business all over the world without speaking each other's languages. And the navigators could learn this so they could account for, you know, when they're bringing cargo here and there, they're dropping it off on the beach for the natives there. They drop their gold. Then, you know, they decide like what's enough, you know, all of this required commerce and this system would not have been possible if, if they didn't develop the letters and that's where the letters come from. They're like, a, they're, yeah, they're laid up. The same ideas are kind of laid. They're coming from the sacred scripts, if you will, right. The hieroglyphics, whatever you want to call it, but there's something for the more common lay people, even though they're still part of that system, right? They're the holy sailors, right? They're still initiated to a degree, but that's, you know, so it's really accessible and chance does a great job. So it, it's like, if you don't have time to read, that's fine. You can just listen to it while you get shit done. It's amazing. All right. I'm about to play this sample. That's a great idea. Here we go. And I'm putting it in the chat so everyone can have a link to uh, pick up the book if they want. And they can even use the Audible free trial to get the book for free. All right. Nice. An ancient universal empire has been forgotten or covered up. I suspect the latter, but I will concede. It's possible that once those who knew the truth passed away, the knowledge became lost. The purpose of this work is to support others who've concluded the same, but were running out of artifacts to prove their claims. There are only so many peculiar superstitions that have no scientific validity. Religious rites, astronomical observations and errors, calendar systems and their mistakes, languages, idioms, allegorical stories taught as history, architecture, systems of government and conveyance, and other patterns that a culture can share before it becomes mathematically impossible for these customs not to be introduced by a common source or for them not to be descended from the same empire or people. Woodward, on the wisdom of Egypt, wrote, quote, the colonies all carried these customs along with them to their several abodes. And there were, from the very beginning, priests, sacrifices, temples, festivals, and lustrations, as well among the ancient Germans and Gauls, in Peru and Mexico, in Siam, China, and Japan, as in Egypt. End quote. Reverend Faber wrote, quote, The religion of the Celts, as professed in Gaul and Britain, 
is palpably the same as that of the Hindus and Egyptians. The same also as that of the Canaanites, the Phrygians, the Greeks, and the Romans. Kanan says that the Phoenicians once possessed the empire of Asia, that they made Egyptian Thebes their capital, and that Cadmus, migrating thence into Europe, built Boeotian Thebes, and called it after the name of his native town. End quote. I don't know if this is fantasy or if there is truth in it, but it's worthy of considering in case it inspires you to look somewhere you might have otherwise disregarded. Camden wrote, quote, Britain is described by Orpheus in the poems which were really written by Onomacritus, who lived in the time of the Pistis Tratidae, according to Clemens Alexandrinus and Tatian, all which proves that Britain was known near 200 years before Aristotle who lived in 384 to 322 B.C., and the ancient geographers, Dicearchus and Eratosthenes, and still more ancient Pythias, end quote. Justus Lipsius quoted Aristotle, quote, In the sea outside the columns of Hercules, the pillars of Hercules at the Strait of Gibraltar, a deserted island had been found, wooded with wood, navigable by rivers, plentiful with fruits, by a distant voyage of many days, into which the Carthaginians had frequently migrated. And many also pitched their settlements, but the chief men, fearing that the wealth of that place might recover by threats, and that Carthage should fall away had guarded against an edict, and sanctioned a capital punishment that no one would wish to have sailed thither afterward. End quote. Regarding this, Lipsus wrote, quote, Which I think is true of one of the new islands, because he spends many days on a voyage, nor was it probable, therefore, that the Canaries or other neighboring tribes were. Our Seneca, for he is certainly the author of the tragedy of Medea, seems to have foretold about them, having already been sung to children. Venient Anis, Secula Seris I think that's the end of it. <laughs> Good sample, though. Hope that whets your appetite. And I think we're going to wrap it up, guys. You uh, you have any closing thoughts? Just make sure you pe let people know where they can find you. Yeah, man. Uh, slick Dissident on the YouTubes. Uh, getting down with the um, Rising from the Ashes crew uh, a little bit more nowadays. Uh, I've been over on the One on One podcast. Catch me there. Weaving spiders, webs. Those are my spots. And Dylan. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm going to plug this into the chat right now. You can find me at beacons.ai slash great tide. And that will take you to all my podcast appearances. I mean, I probably at this point got like 40 hours of uh, content for people to watch or more. Um, also my YouTube to, to watch like my, my posts that I do, um, my sub stack and everything else. And um, I'll pu pu put uh, my sub stack in for anybody who's interested and sees this. All you have to do is go to my Instagram, which is I'll type it. It's at the holy sailors. And all you will do is you will send me two message. If you're interested in this offer, you will send me a message chance. So I know where this is coming from. And then you'll send me your email and only your email. No, hey, how you doing? No, thank you. No salutation. Just, I'm not going to read it. I'm, what it allows me to do is it allows me to copy and paste your email straight into my sub stack and I'll give you a free month. Now, if you've already taken advantage of this in the past, please don't message me. I'll block you if you're trying to do this twice. But if you, anybody you gave chance, whatever, anybody who's interested, if it's your first time, I'll give you a free month 
And uh, it's an opportunity for you to access the last three months of work that I've done and the future month of posts that I have scheduled. And there's tons of gravy. And so I just uh, uh, plugged it in there. Uh, nice. So it's, uh, that's my sub stack. So again, just go to my Instagram, message me, and uh, I'll hook you up with a free paid subscription so you get access to everything. Right on. You know, uh, I got one more hanging, Chad. Uh, Chance, can you pull up the very last graphic I sent you before we went on, on the Telegram? This is a fun one, Dylan. Because uh, I, I knew we were going to, at the, uh, the Alexandria. And so I put together the Suicide Squad. This is the squad. Is and that now, a real per? Like, these are real. That What is that creature in the top right? Are you kidding me? <laughs> This is a real, this is our government. This is our government, man. So this, this is what? the squad. This is the squad. It could, is comprised of nine individuals. I'm not very well versed in most of them, but we know uh, uh, Casio Alexandria Cortez. Her initials are uh, O A C spells KO. Chaos is her initials. And she has Alexandria in her name. Well, look at the person next to her. The name of, if Caesar didn't burn down Alexandria, it was uh, the, uh, Kaf, what's he called? He's called the Khalifa Umar. Well, look at the person next to her is Umar. And now look down in the bottom corner is a guy named Caesar. And so all of this this that ain't Caesar, that's Casa. Don't you confuse Cass us, motherfucker. Because I'm a Caesar, <laughs> Gabe. You better not be confusing me with these motherfuckers. There's even and a bush. There's know, even we a had, we had the sword in the book. We were very the book represents wisdom, scrolls, whatever, and the sword. So that's spiritual power, and the sword is temporal power. I guarantee you, nobody in my family burned down the library of Alexandria. Right. Well, they've covered both you. bases. They've covered both bases because this. You know, some people say it was this Umar guy. Some people say it was Caesar. Probably wasn't either one, but they have both of those names here and they have a bush in the group, which is uh, implies burning. It, 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 it burning immediately bush. brings forward the burning. And so I find it quite fascinating that these uh, these actors were brought onto the stage just in time for the new modern day burning of Alexandria. Uh, and their names, I've got their names listed there. And uh, I actually think I could, uh, I mean, we've got a summer. We've got a. Uh, uh, yeah, you guys I might hate me, but when it comes to the Ocasio woman. Yeah. Wood. <laughs> Her teeth kind of scare me, but yeah, I see what you're saying. <laughs> Yeah, but I thought I'd bring all these guys up uh, and just kind of point out that they have all the ingredients from the uh, from the collapse of a of a tower from way back when. So is and the here, guy in the middle Sagittarius, or the bowman? I'm wondering. I'm wondering. He totally has it. You know, the, all the symbols are the mighty here. Mighty hunter before the Lord. It's so fascinating. And then, uh, yeah, there's a lot in these names. You know, and they are. I mean. I'm so convinced they're all constructs, every single one of them, all the way down to their alleged birth dates, you know, which I did not even entertain to look into. But it's just what if that's why it got so bad, Gabe, is because they couldn't just like let a government run without this like minutia underlying thing that they had to like program in everybody. And that's like what's caused like <laughs> Like that, it's like what is it called? Like anal. There's like a word for it where you get like so superstitious it becomes almost like a disorder where it's like you're Jack Nicholson and as good as it gets, and it's like you got to turn around. <laughs> it's basically yeah, it's OCD. It's obsessive yeah. Is that what it's called? Disorder. A lot yeah, of the, what if that's what it is? A lot <laughs> yeah. of occultism is that. I'm not saying there isn't any value in matching up symbolic correspondences to represent the intention of what it is you're trying to work on, but. When it goes too far, like there's there's something to be said to just like go for it, do the thing. Don't you don't always have to worry about if it's under the right stars or whatever. You know, right. if you're in if you're in the proper flow of nature, you're at, you're connected with nature. Then what you do is going to be aligned with the sky clock and with nature anyway, right? I mean, do we really need to? At the end of the day, like, does a deer know 
all this esoteric stuff and needed to thrive. No, like this is just, uh, you know, we're, we're, <laughs> we're trying to lock pick the mind of God or the creator. Yes. And figure <laughs> out where, how, how everything came to be. That's great. It's a fun exercise, but uh, it does. Yeah. There is definitely the whole OCD element of, of magic big time. Right. And so, all yeah, right. I've had, I had to bring the suicide squad in uh, because that namesake goes back to uh, Jack Parsons and them uh, experimenting on how to blow things up. So there is an explosive element, even to the word squad. Uh, and just in that occult circle, I just had to throw the, throw in the suicide squad component. So what's their, what's Who's the this guy? group of uh, politicians? What's their, group about what are they doing they're uh they're like a false underlay of fresh blood to the uh to the legislative system you know they needed younger faces they you know because there's so many uh what's the word like it's a uh it's a geriocracy we're, we're being run by a geriocracy so they had to put all these fresh actors on the stage so it looked like you know the uh, younger uh demographics had representation whatsoever and di diversity too weaponized weaponized inclusion <laughs> yeah isn't it crazy that like you know what's it's so wild to me is because i feel like this country for the longest time when i was growing up had totally gotten over race and people can say that's not true but honestly it is from where I grew up. Like it's same, bro. Nobody gave a shit. Racial jokes were the funniest things because they're all focused on true stereotypes and comedy is true, which is what makes it funny, which allows you to like say true things, be funny, let the pressure release, make yes. fun of each other's and and I never even thought about people's race until like the like now it's like become this thing where it's like what you say with these underlying things like it's almost like uh, it's like they they want to cater to people like, see, they're the same color as you. You should trust them like this weird shit where it's like, can we just like talk about whether they're good enough for a fucking job or not? Like this country literally can't afford to give a shit about somebody's religion or race at this point. We need competency. You know what yeah, I mean? Man. Like there's like this weird backwards shit that's happened over the last decade maybe more but it's like what the fuck is going on here dude i don't i don't recognize my own country it's i feel like a foreigner yeah we definitely went backwards on so much progress i agree it was not like that the way i grew up man everybody had love it was a, it was a thing of familiarity to, yeah. to you know to joke around about other people's roots and i mean it was in it was endearing in fact you know i had a buddy uh well, maybe I shouldn't say this. I don't know. It's a new day and age. But I had a buddy. He was Latino, and he had a car, and we called we called his car the Panic because his brakes didn't work very well. And every time he'd come up to a stop, we'd he'd start pumping the brakes, and we weren't sure we were going to make it. So we would be like, every time we would say, "Oh, the damn Panic," and somebody in the back seat would be like, "Who's Panic?" And the person in the front would be like, "His Panic." Blah 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 blah. <laughs> Like, how can you not find that funny? And it was so like, much fun. Like, can you, does, is there anybody who had watching that and would think that there's hatred under your voice or anything while you told that story? Like, what the fuck is going on? Like, it's clearly no hatred. I don't know. I, I just feel like it's, it's like we were raised one way and then they flipped a switch and said, hey, by the way, you're, the way you were raised in your culture is no longer acceptable. And now you have to be offended by everything. And it's like, wait, what? I'm not fucking changing for you. Are you kidding me? It's like, it's, it's really bizarre what's going on. And I hope it gets cleaned out with like, maybe we need some sort of breakdown in order for people to, to not have the luxury to, to focus on shit like that. Yeah. It's like a uh, of small differences. Yeah. There it is again. Is, again, Gabe has like, what, you said something last week that, or last time that was super profound. I can't remember it off the top of my head, but I was like, "Damn, that's one of the most." You, you that was the that neurosis, the 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 bickering of over the, like the little differences that's infested our country, dude. It's infested yeah, the West. 
Yep. And it's something everybody should take a minute, learn about, you know, recognize it when it comes up and, you know, and, and address it head on, you know, hit it head on every time. Cause it's going to happen again. Guaranteed. And it's the kind of thing that doesn't affect you if you're secure in knowing you're doing the right thing for yourself and in the flow of what is supportive of life for you and the people that you care about. It is, I think that the whole problem is a bunch of people <laughs> entrained that guilt, shame, and suffering are what make them good. Okay, so this is definitely thematic to what we've been discussing today. And then because this is a self-sabotaging energy that they're carrying innately and that real success, you know, they're terrified of that because it would look like not having anything to be guilty or ashamed about. Then because they need some feeling of superiority to motivate them to get out of bed in the day morning, you know, they have to then find what to nitpick about everybody else. And that bullying type of deal that goes on with, you know, I, I would support you. You know, I, I was with you until you said we didn't land on the moon. Guys, wow. is it Karen culture or is it Karen culture? The C, <laughs> the horn, right? You know, the Kronos, Corona. Oh, you know? dude, you know that in the Islamic uh, version of that word, uh, they have a word called Karen that is a guardian or watcher spirit that's like the the devil on your shoulder that reports your bad behavior back to, to God or the demiurge. Did you know that you're, you're just muted. There you go. I didn't say that. I, I, I heard you with the, in yeah, the Islamic the mythology. Karen, they have a Karen or a Karen. And it reports you to the demiurge. It's like the thing watching you and then goes and tells on you to the demiurge when you do bad stuff. It's That's the crazy. placenta on your sh on your shoulder, keeping a list. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I came across another arche word, or ras, or raj, and it's in Arabic. It's uh, forgive me, people. Arabic is not my thing. Um, I, I recognize like the the system, but it's uh, if you were to type in uh, R E I S, it's going to mean chief or leader, or in some cases, like the, in, depending on context, admiral. So it looks like a race, a race, a race, a race, a race. somebody who's Arabic will have to, to uh, uh, do that. I'll, 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 uh... A Karin is among the Jen creatures. And oh, not geez. to be confused, a Karina, a Karina, a female childbed demon. <laughs> <laughs> but they had they had a genie for everything, you know, in the Arabic. But a karin in the Quran, very similar word there. Whosoever turns away from remembering and mentioning the most beneficent, we appoint for him a Satan to be a karin for him. Karin. <laughs> That's a verse from the Quran. Imagine like if this was like we were getting mocked by like Arabs and they were creating all this Karen memes and shit. <laughs> Like, hey, in my experience, the Arabs are the cool ones in all this. Uh, they're, they're, yeah. they're more cool. I think cool everybody's ones. got their cool ones and crazy yeah, yeah, exactly, ones, you know? exactly. Like, even the really therapeutes is... and the yeah, the Essenes and all that. Like even the ascetics, the, every group of people. There's all the whole spectrum of humanity exists in every collective. That's why I try not to focus on people. I focus on the system because. Attack the the idea, not the man. Yeah, it's exactly. It's just, like that's what the philosophy of small differences leaves behind and attacks the man of the idea. Yeah, buddy. And yeah, that's buddy. why I like people like from now on. Like, don't even tell me who said what. Just say what do you think of the address the claim. I don't care who said it because it could be some one of my friends who said it. It could be someone I can't stand who said it. But if it's true, it's true. And if it's not true, it's not true. So even if it was my friend that said something that was untrue, I would address the claim and say, yeah, that's that's debunkable you know yeah that's what that's what you know we don't it's good to address the man if the man is a liar <laughs> right. Like if somebody, right if i catch someone lying then i'm like yeah that guy's disingenuous if someone's right. just wrong and they don't know they're wrong that's it's a you know and the truth the truth thrives in scrutiny it seeks out scrutiny to prove itself day after day yeah, man. Which is what science is supposed to do. All right, That's if we quit up. now, we're at 322. 
in the oh, stream. Illuminati. Guys, confirmed. this was a pleasure. I had so much fun. This was a this was a really you guys blew my mind with that hero thing. I think you need to explore that a little bit because that was. Was, There's yeah. got to be more. Yeah, that's. I, a, I highly recommend the Cratylus. Everybody should go read the dialogues of Cratylus because it gets into like the the psycho spiritual origin of sound and its attachment to the subject. Is it a convention? Is it from the gods? And uh, and it gets into the link blood. in the vibrant chat for that on Telegram. Okay, we'll do. We'll do. Or the interverse chat. I'll forward it to the other, whichever you put it in. All right, I'll do it in the interverse. All right, and everybody here that's still hanging out with us, I'm putting the Vibrant call-in line link. That's where you can send us stuff for the show on future episodes and the interverse chat on Telegram where you can just hang out with us. So we have a good time. And uh, Merry Christmas to all and to all a good night. Thanks, Dylan. It's been really fun hanging with you as always. Looking forward to the next one. People check him out on Crow Triple Seven. He just had an episode. Forgot to mention that. And uh, Gabe, always fun to hang with you. Love you guys. Peace.